right, Jake, what do you say we rock out for the 17 people that are here early? Uh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Hell yeah. So right before we, uh, we went live for the pre-show banter, uh, we were talking about some fun techniques uh, for trying to bypass some PowerShell execution restrictions that you get on some endpoint security products. And one of the ones that uh, popped up last night is there's an old tool called PA exec. It's by Power Admin. And if you are trying to run PS exec and it's getting stopped by like Sophos or any endpoint products, PA exec seems to work just fine. The other thing that we were talking about, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about some malware. Maybe you kind of came up with some really cool examples. Because about two years ago, we did a number of blog posts at BHIS on bypassing um, silence. And one of those was just renaming PowerShell.exe to something like Explorer.exe, which subsequently was caught. Uh, but we found out that you can rename it to p.exe, and it still works. And then you talked about some malware that was doing something very similar, and I think that that's interesting, uh, how like the pen testing community can come up with techniques, and then we start seeing it in the wild as well. What was some of the things that you've seen in malware that they've been using similar techniques as well? Yeah, generally, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't PowerShell. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as far as the uh, PowerShell rename, but one of the things that we've seen a lot of work with, we've seen a lot of uh, C script, uh, you know, as far as the uh, the old uh, VB script uh, style scripts, there, um, you know, being uh, basically renamed, and, and so what they'll do is the attacker will copy, uh, basically to get around uh, some of the, uh, I suspect, well, antivirus bypass in, in some way or endpoint mm -hmm. protection bypass, but they'll copy C script into the app data folder, and then they're executing the macros, uh, executing the macros from from there, basically, or executing the VB scripts from there, which is really interesting because, you know, again. Uh, this isn't something that we, uh, you know, I mean, again, it, it's not rocket science. As you pointed out, this is a technique that certainly renaming uh, to get around uh, renaming restrictions. I mean, think about like, like for instance, uh, you know, when you've got something where it says, hey, you know, user uh, can only execute from a particular folder or uh, user can't execute command prompt. I mean, some of the old, uh, remember some of the old kiosks that we used to, uh, we used to yep. hack, you, you'd copy <laughs> command prompt onto the desktop and then it yep. would run. Yep. You know, or you'd use like on-screen keyboard and then you would open up uh, notepad.exe, navigate to cmd.exe and open it. Old school fun stuff. Yep. Oh, my favorite one of those is, uh, you know, the old help and support trick, right? You get on, uh, you know, command prompt isn't there, but you get in help and support and, and, and actually look in help, um, say help for the command prompt. And there's a link that opens the command prompt from that's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. <laughs> So. Speaking of mind blowing, I think I got a new gift for you uh, for this week. Uh, we just saw this. This company is running like a really, really amazing endpoint security project, uh, like uh, product. It's, it's just fantastic. One of those really expensive products that you very rarely see in many environments, and it would stop almost everything that you would run against it. Um, however, this particular organization also has domain users and the local administrator group. Yeah. Ugh. And and and. Every user has full write privileges to the uh, Windows directory. I mean, what could go wrong, right? I, at the end of the day, I, oh, actually, I can think of a lot of stuff that could go wrong. <laughs> you know, that, that one's really interesting, right? Because of the Windows directory, um, you know, it's, I mean, look, be, beyond, it's obviously horrible. There's not even a question there. But, but a couple of things that strike me there, right? Explorer.exe or desktop runs out of the Windows directory rather than Windows System 32. Um, and obviously, Explorer has a number of uh, DLLs that it that it loads, and and of course, uh, you know, we we talk. Gosh, do you remember? I'm, I feel like I'm in the wayback machine now. But do you remember the ntshuri.dll um, yep. that uh, APT1 was using? I mean, that's how old we're talking. That's APT1, APT1. like that's, one. <laughs> one. That's like right after Rob Lee coined the term. Yeah, I mean, literally, it's it's it, this is the OG of uh, you know, <laughs> the the OG of APTs, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, they were using that technique, dropping that uh, ntshuri.dll. Um, and, and so, you know, as you looked at your auto runs, that there wasn't an auto run there specifically, um, but they were using a proxy DLL. So as you as your desktop loaded, um, their malware loaded with it, and then they proxied in the the original DLL itself. So you know, again, any user that would have write permissions to to Windows system, I mean, you're not going to pick you're not going to pick up the uh, you're not going to pick that up with most EDRs. Is is really what it comes down to. So yeah, you said it, this is a security product that screwed this up? No, 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 it's not a security product. Oh, it's it, it, And we see this actually a lot. I mean, all joking aside, where people buy a really expensive product like Carbon Black or Silence or CrowdStrike or um, what's the other one? Uh, Dark Trace or something like that. Yeah, Sentinel-1's and, been big recently is another big one I keep seeing. Yeah, but, but, but the problem with all of those is people think that they can buy the product and then they can drop, drop it right on top of their really crappy infrastructure without it doing any house cleaning to start. And bad things are going to happen for sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. That that's hundred percent, hundred percent of the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. The other thing I wanted to chat with you about is it appears that Ions is going to try to set us up on a count, uh, like a point counterpoint uh, presentation on blockchain. And oh, uh, winning. Yeah. So, and this is weird because we all have a pretty good idea about your your concepts on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And I actually had a, a contract. I did a small class for a number of people in the DoD uh, where I wrote up a four day contract and a four day class on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, it's weird. I think blockchain is a thing. I think it's absolutely a thing. I don't think it's revolutionary. I also think cryptocurrency is here to stay. Like you better get ready because it's going to be here. I don't necessarily think it's going to be Bitcoin, but it was interesting to me when I was researching it, how absolutely convinced everyone is that it's a panacea to all ills. Number yeah. one. Um, number two, I, I love smart contracts. Have you done much research in smart contracts in Ethereum? Yeah, I, actually, did you uh, did you follow? I, I don't know that we've ever talked about Sorcoin. Um, did, did you hear mm -hmm. about the Sorcoin debacle? No, I did not. Not about that one. Because there's so, so many. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. This this one actually deals with, with a smart contract. And it was really interesting. Um, I got involved in this. Uh, it was actually between an Australian and a Singapore uh, business. Um, uh, Sorcoin comes out of Singapore. They were trying to replace PayPal uh, with cryptocurrency, right? And very, very ill-defined white paper, all kinds of dumbness there. Um, but uh, TLDR, um, they executed a smart contract with a back door in it. Um, and that smart contract, basically the satisfaction or the execution of that smart contract um, would allow, uh, basically satisfied a, a legal contract. Of course, as you know, smart contracts are not legal contracts. But basically, a, as part of a legal contract, this Australian uh, cryptocurrency exchange offered to sell a uh, stake, I think 49% or something, for $5 million in Sorcoin. Um, when they later tried to liquidate some of this, because the trading you know, is, is fairly low on this, maybe $200,000 a day at the time, uh, they tried to liquidate a couple million, which crashed the market. Um, mm -hmm. Sorcoin's uh, founders who own, you know, control that, that uh, key, uh, you know, basically exercised their rights with the back door. In the smart contract and 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 legally um initially they said hey we've done nothing wrong all right we, we the back door was here you could have audited the contract any idiot could see it um and i know that because i mean it took me three seconds to see it in the smart contract um, yep. it was like hey there's a it, it there's says a they're giving you the money but they can take it back anytime <laughs> and they're like no it's like yeah like literally you should look at the smart contract but well, a lot of people aren't thinking that so and if you look at like the dao contract uh attack back in 2016 oh, um, I think it's interesting, like, you know, whenever you have a smart contract that is so bad and a hack happens that it's so bad that you're thinking about forking the, co the, the entire code base to basically yeah. fix that problem, you have a fundamental problem in the approach. And, uh, and I, I, the attacker, did you ever read the open email that the attacker sent to the community? Um, that yeah, absolutely. Attack? And I hate to say this, but part of me kind of agrees with him. He said, you created yeah. the smart contract. I executed within the context of the smart contract. I was able to get a whole bunch of mo money, a time, basically a time of check versus time of use error. And he said it completely undermines the entire concept of a, uh, of a smart contract if you completely invalidate what happened every single time it happens. So it's, it's very, very interesting. So I think it's about time for us to get started uh, here in yep, just yep. a couple of seconds. You read my mind. All right. All right. Well, everyone, if you could please go on mute and uh, I'll start. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Gearing Up for 2019, Best Practices to Consider, sponsored by Infoblox, Carbon Black, Cybel Angel, and Cisco. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speakers are John Pescatori, SANS Director of Emerging Technologies, who will be moderating today's webcast. John Strand, Senior Instructor with the SANS Institute. And Jake Williams, SANS Analyst, Senior SANS Instructor, and Course Author. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to John Pescatori. Okay, thanks, Carol, and welcome, everyone. I'm John Pescatori. Welcome to our uh, SANS webinar. It's actually a very interesting day to have a webinar. 
It's uh, December 7th, which is the 77th anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in, during World War II. And that's a great example of a very damage-causing attack where we actually had intelligence a few days earlier that told us such an attack was likely. And, and hours before, we had essentially early intrusion detections alerts, the first use of radar detecting inbound aircraft that was given off for that attack that was dismissed as a false positive. And uh, so a lot of lessons learned there. So it's interesting to apply that as we look forward to what we learned in 2018 and uh, some of the things we should do in 2019. So let me give you an idea of what we're going to go through. I'm going to do a very uh, brief flyby and sort of set the stage. And then uh, John Strand will come on and go through some uh, cool stuff about some of the latest attacks, particularly against cloud services, which you'll see I'll uh, put some emphasis on at the beginning. We'll then turn it over to Jake Williams, who's going to go through some pretty uh, powerful techniques for making the attackers' jobs a lot harder, if not stopping them, to make them be a lot noisier, a lot, a lot uh, faster to detect if you're doing things right. We're going to save a lot of time at the end for questions questions as you see, but as we're going along, if you do have questions, I'll give you a little picture of where to enter them in the, in the uh, next slide. I'll try to take some of them as we go along. I'll uh, be monitoring the question windows and can ask John and Jake the questions you might have directed towards them at the end of their talks. And we do want to thank our sponsors. Um, it does cost money to bring the uh, top SANS instructors to you this way. And so I want to thank Carbon Black, Cyber Angel, and Infobox for sponsoring this webcast, but it'll be uh, pure SANS content. So on the uh, toolbar on the right-hand side, you see the questions, we'll enter them in. As I said, I'll be watching that window as we go along, and we'll see if we can work some of the questions in real time. If you are watching a recorded version of this webcast, we'll give you an email address at the end where you can send your questions in, and we'll get them routed to the right people. So with that, let's get started. I've uh, worked my entire career in cybersecurity, and uh, just like movies and plays, there's sort of a standard structure at every cybersecurity presentation or webinar where uh, just like uh, three-act structures you see in dramas where first we set things up and then there's lots and lots of bad news and bad things happen, and then we're three quarters of the way done, and at the very end we tell you, uh, here's the good news, here's the happy ending when the resolution happens. Well, uh, part of what I do at SANS is talk with boards of directors of companies and CEOs and then help CISOs learn how to communicate and influence boards of directors. And one common comment comes back that we're very strong in security on those first couple of acts and, and not so strong on the end. So the goal here for this talk and actually for most things that SANS does is to spend a lot more time on the action side of things, things you can do things you can go back to work on Monday and do. So uh, let's we're going to stick with that structure and uh, see if we can spend the most of the next two hours in, in Act 3 there on the resolution with a happy ending where the boy gets the girl back versus they both die in a sinking ship at the end. So um, I've, as I mentioned, I've worked my whole career in cybersecurity. In fact, uh, 1978, I got out of college 40 years ago and went to work at NSA. Uh, and that sort of started me off on cybersecurity. And over those years, always see... Uh, sort of three major factors causing breakage in the way we're doing cybersecurity. And uh, the first is change in business use of technology. It's not IT organizations that drive new technologies. It's the businesses that demand new things. And IT reacts usually slowly, sometimes more quickly, um, very rarely in a, in a sort of well thought out way from a security perspective. But those business trends are one area of breakage. The bad guys then come up with threats to quickly take advantage of those weaknesses and those new technologies. And I'm going to leave that end of things to John and Jake. Uh, that'll be the bulk of what they're talking about and addressing. Another area that sort of follows after those first two waves is press coverage of attacks and bad things happening and politicians and boards of directors and CEOs start to notice. And we start to see either regulations or laws, or we start to see a sort of excrement rolling downhill from management about these bad things that did happen. So I'm going to touch on uh, the first and the third, and uh, we'll have lots of great drill down on sort of threats and what to do about them as uh, John and Jake go through their sections. So quick look back on 2018. If you look at some of the numbers, the quantities of things, I like to look at the Identity Theft Resource Center data. They at least do things the same way every day, and it's based on when data is public versus uh, 
limited sources or questionable sources of data. This year, we'll actually end up with sl uh, probably a, almost 20% fewer numbers of publicly disclosed breaches than we saw in 2017. However, especially when you add in this latest humongous one at Marriott, the absolute number of records exposed and the, the sort of average size of the breach will significantly go up over 2017, which means the expense per attack, the cost per attack to the businesses that got hit definitely went up. And when you look at some of the uh, uh, types of data that were exposed, there's still uh, a lot of very expensive, very sensitive data being exposed. Now, when you look at most of those exposures, there was a growth of uh, exposures of insecure cloud storage, S3 buckets and the like. Um, definitely a major issue this year is businesses moving sensitive workloads out to uh, infrastructure as a service in particular, things like Azure and, and AWS definitely increased. A lot of the attacks uh, started to go after those things, but most of the exposures you see are still from our own data centers. They haven't even started yet in a big way to go after some of those badly protected cloud workloads. Uh, it's getting harder these days uh, now that the Verizon data breach report isn't quite as detailed as it used to be to get good statistics on what was the basic cause, what enabled the breach. But still, when you do find the data, invariably, 80% or more, it was a lack of basic security hygiene sort of along the lines of the CIS critical security controls, whether failures in noticing or mitigating vulnerabilities or avoiding vulnerabilities or failures in, in employing simple ways of protecting yourself or simple ways of making sure you're more quickly detect an attack. Uh, now, uh, before coming to SAN six years ago, I spent almost 14 years at Gartner. In those 20 years, every time I've looked into this, when you look at why did one transportation company get creamed by WannaCry, or why did one hotel chain get creamed by point of sale or, 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 or web malware and others did not, invariably the ones that stayed safe did not spend more uh, than their rivals in that vertical and didn't have dramatically bigger security staffs. It's not just a problem of spending. It's a problem of putting your resources in the right places, making sure your people have the right skills to deal with those changes in technology and changes in threats. That's really key. And that's what hope you'll go away from uh, my brief overview here. When we look at the projections on those business trends, you know, I always look to the McKinsey's and, and the big uh, consulting firms and Gartner. Can you see Gartner's slide here? Here's the, from their surveys of CIOs and CTOs, what the big trends are. And rather than go through each individual item, let me sort of translate this for you. There's sort of three things you always see in these projections. Um, one is, what are the things the business units are saying uh, need to be coming along in technology? What are they driving? And on this, you see the things related to things or the items related to things. Autonomous things are essentially devices or software agents that are using things like AI and other techniques to take actions on their own. Sort of a scary thought. And that's sort of what Empowered Edge is as well, putting the sort of processing capability and the decision making closer to those devices on the edge. Another thing you see the business demanding, you see immersive experience. This is the idea of how do we convert more visitors to our online sites into actual buying transactions. Uh, this digital twins thing is another example of that, but that's sort of a, an overhyped one. The interesting one on there that was pulled in by business, because I can guarantee you it wasn't IT who pulled this one in, where you see digital digital ethics and privacy. Because of all these breaches, because of many things that have gone on, whether it's in the elections or on Facebook, there definitely is a lot more consumer pull for privacy and protection of their information and businesses react to what consumers want. That's their job. The third category you see is what I call sort of hype related things. And that's where you see blockchain, smart spaces, quantum computing, not that those aren't gonna be valid, te aren't valid technologies and will prove useful, but they tend to be sort of flavor of the month and, and businesses throw them on there. So you see Bill, or, or, uh, consulting firms and firms like Gartner throw those on there. You see the, the Bill Gates quote, I've always liked it down there. We, we tend to overestimate what's gonna happen near term from these type of things and sort of underestimate the long-term changes. So it's important to look at these things, in particular, the business-driven ones. Those are the ones that will happen first. Those are the ones that will have the short-term impact on what technologies IT tries out and how they roll them out. So those, those are the ones we should be thinking about top of mind for security. So here's sort of my summary of some of the things to look for. Uh, 
use of infrastructure as a service and hybrid cloud, essentially more actual uh, sensitive workloads and production type workloads moving out to cloud services versus the you know Salesforce's and Office 365 software as a service type things. This is just, that that's out of the box already. It's just gonna grow. Um, as part of dealing with that, IT moving to faster development cycles and DevOps and Agile and those type of things will grow. That's actually an opportunity for security. Every time there's one of these major changes, transitions in IT, it's an opportunity to get them doing things the right way, get security plugged in in every one of the sprints that's going on in DevOps or every one of the, the sort of startups or playbooks they're putting together to do this. Um, you know, when you look at it, most of the attacks are still enabled by malware running on Windows. Um, when you look at the absolute share of uh, Windows, it's definitely not going away, but it's not growing either. It's flat to slightly declining. Other things are starting to pop up, certainly the Androids and the iOSs of the world, uh, but even you know uh, cloud-based workloads that are running on apps that are very different from things we've protected in the past. This internet of things is out there. A lot of it is really dumb devices, and a lot of it's been way over hyped, but, Businesses are demanding more use of more things and delivering business services. This makes IT's jobs even harder, makes it more of a heterogeneous problem for them. It's not just you know 90% Windows, 10% Linux. They're not good at managing heterogeneity. The maturity of what they're doing, believe it or not, is gonna go down. Yeah, on the flip side, the odd thing is at home, we're seeing more users start to use stronger authentication, whether it's simple as text messaging or complex as Google selling out of their Titan USB Bluetooth keys for two-factor authentication turning on or, or using operating systems and other things that do have app control, the users are actually seeing higher levels of security in that stuff than they are on their desktops at work. Um, and they're starting to demand, why isn't something better happening to my data? Not that any of these things they're doing are impenetrable, but they're a whole lot better than the standard reusable passwords and, and stuff uh, IT is feeding them at work. Um, one thing that comes out of the business side, everybody's read that you know in cybersecurity, there's 500,000, there's a million unfilled jobs. Well, if you look Look at those numbers that would say staffs at companies are going to double we know that's not going to happen uh, no company can simply afford to double its staff and similarly we see the vendors replying that well we're machine learning ai machine learning whether it's in security tools or uh, analysis tools data science tools is going to make up the difference no that's not the case smarter people using smarter tools invariably every time is what makes the difference not not just one or the other in the real world now, moving over towards the, the regulatory stuff or other sort of dictates that come from above that impact what we do in security, you know, it's simple when you look at the headlines, what people on boards of directors or your CEO is seeing, seeing a lot of failures. Um, you know, things like the Marriott breach, well, it really, we saw it in 2015 initially, and then 2017, other things were pointed out, and then the Starwood merger, and whoops, 500 million people, and this will be a huge bill, or FedEx getting hit by a uh, wanna cry, not pet you type of attacks, and other companies with $300 million hard hits they had to announce to Wall Street, then it obviously wakes up boards of directors. So when they see this, politicians see this, they decide they can help us. They're gonna step in and help us, which very rarely is actual help, but it does impact what we do. So I think what uh, uh, one board of direct, one director said to me, and I found this quote on the internet, I forget where it actually came from, but you know, when we look at what C-level people, whether it's CEO, CIO, CFO, or CISO are telling us, and we see they're screwing up, if they repeat the mistake, we're pretty sure they're making a decision to do bad things. We don't trust them as an executive. It's not a failure to make a mistake once, it's a failure to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So as we start looking Look into next year what sort of things I think will happen. You know, the European model for sort of privacy has been over the years much stronger than the US with more of an opt in. Users have to opt in to the exposure of their information. We're starting to see that pop up in state level le legislation, even, even uh, some of the federal stuff that takes forever to, to go through, but it, it is starting to change. Businesses are starting to react to some of the European regulations plus some of the use of cloud services with turning on more data encryption. Now, mostly at the device level, like on laptops or smartphones, but increasingly on some of the storage as a service offerings. And I think we'll see it turned on more at infrastructure as a service. It does raise lots of requirements for key management. I think you'll hear John talk a little bit about uh, CASBs, Cloud Access Security Brokers. They're sort of a technology some are using that actually make it easier to manage public and private keys and make it easier to do this type of encryption. Uh, we're starting to see 
most companies, not just manufacturing, but retail and others, when they suffer these security incidents, like the ones in the headlines before, it's real world impact to their operations. Ransomware is a great example. It's not just a data breach. It's that, that we have to spend money on lawyers and notification. It's actually stopped our operations. So COOs are starting to say, wait a minute, uh, I'm getting asked questions about why uh, we're missing our numbers because of these security incidents. It's not just the uh, IT side of things. And then finally, back to the staffing side of things, because this plays up lots of regulations coming up on boards of directors need security skills. What are the security skills that uh, enterprises need and should have? I'll, th I'll throw out a slide right at the very end here of what we heard back from the SANS community about the need to plus up the skills of the existing staff base, uh, versus just simply adding more people to the mix. So here it is, and then I'll turn it over to John. Uh, Alan Paller and I put a query out onto the SANS Newsbyte uh, newsletter for a couple of weeks and asked uh, hiring people and people who'd started at security jobs, you know, when you're hiring college people or when you started your job coming from a college degree, what tools that are out there do you wish your new hires really knew how to use or uh, that you wish you knew how to use when you when you first took the job? And you see the top list. These are the nine that stood out and above from the others. And you see there's a couple commercial ones on there, uh, Splunk and I classify PowerShell as commercial. Most of them are actually open source or open source ones with commercial equivalents. And a lot of them have to do with monitoring and analysis and logging sort of and, and inventory, knowing what's out there, knowing uh, the staff that's skilled in using the tools. And again, those basic security hygiene type skills. Others that didn't make the, the tool list, but made the, the comments they gave us back were the ability to use the standard defense, defensive firewall, IDS, IPS type take capabilities out there in the management suites and, and ways to manage policies and push out new policies and make sure we're taking advantage of those. And then simple things like, yeah, we don't necessarily need a uh, data data lake or data scientist. Uh, if you can use Excel and pull in data from TCB dump and uh, other tools, um, those are the skills we need. The cloud definitely stood up, this need of plussing up the skills of all of our staff from the sort of pen testing side to the vulnerability assessment side to the cyber operations side to the SOC staff on plussing up skills on what's different in the cloud, how do we extend our capabilities out to the cloud, how do we deal with this rush to move more and more out to the cloud. So with that as sort of a backdrop, let me turn it over to John and we'll uh, proceed on our way. Thank you so much. And I think uh, talking about the cloud is a great transition for the section that I'm going to be talking about. And the reason why I want to focus on this is not necessarily a prediction. Uh, you know, trying to predict the future is interesting in computer security because many times what you're doing is just regurgitating what the past is because we see the same problem showing up again and again and again. And when we're looking at cloud computing and we're looking at computer security and we're looking specifically at pen testing uh, in the cloud, there are a lot of the exact same problems, but there's also some unique challenges that we need to deal with as well. So I'll be talking about that as we progress before I hand it over to Jake. So I'm going to talk about what we never got right before we actually move to the cloud. We're gonna talk about some Google attacks, how to attack Google app domains, Outlook Web Access, Office 365 attacks. I'm gonna discuss briefly how I think the browser is the new endpoint, and then what we can and should be doing to handle this problem, which also leads into more problems as well. So what did we never get right in the first place? Look, we never got Active Directory, firewall, segmentation, passwords right at all. We just didn't. And in many of the organizations that we do security assessments with, we see the exact same problem showing up again and again and again. And now a lot of those organizations that never got those things correct at all are basically saying, let's start moving all of this stuff into the cloud and somehow hoping that it's going to be better there. And there is a promise that it's going to be better there, right? When we're looking at loud, uh, excuse me, large scale cloud providers, they say things like, you don't have to worry about patching, you don't have to worry about management, you don't have to worry about keeping the servers up, you don't have to worry about any of that because it's now going to be a cloud service and everything's going to be great. And all of that is true. Without question, it is nice to not necessarily have to worry about patching your email service whenever you're using Google for your apps domain. It's nice not having to necessarily worry about any you know new vulnerabilities that need to be patched in Active Directory whenever you're using Azure AD. There's some truth to that. However, there are still a large, massive set of opportunities to fail horribly whenever you're starting to move a tremendous amount of your infrastructure to the cloud. And we're starting to see more and more of our customers, especially in newer organizations that are just getting started with their entire business, 
actually completely bypassing the traditional Active Directory kind of internal segmentation and firewalling completely, and instead of moving it completely to the cloud. And once again, I can see exactly why they would actually do that. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. So whenever we're trying to break into organizations at Black Hills Information Security, we have a tremendous amount of luck password spraying. And this is something that's been around literally since the dawn of time whenever it comes to computer security, and it still works today. And right now for us, we'd like to have a big shout out and thank you to Microsoft and Google because they make it incredibly easy for us to do this type of attack. And why does this matter? This matters because this was in fact an OWASP top 10 vulnerability back at the very beginning of the OWASP top 10. The ability to actually intercept, or excuse me, the ability to harvest user IDs and passwords has been a security issue for as long as I've been involved in computer security for the past 18, 20 years. And the issue with Microsoft and Google is you can actually write tools that will determine whether or not you've provided a valid user ID and you can harvest those user IDs. And then based on the user IDs that you put in, you can then start up another script and you can harvest valid passwords. Now, from this, a lot of the large scale vendors, and to be fair, a lot of organizations like to say, rather mistakenly, that it's okay. If we have two factor authentication, we don't have to worry about this at all because all we need to do is go to the loving arms of two-factor authentication and things falling on the floor behind me. The loving arms of two-factor authentication, then all good security practices that predated two-factor authentication can now be promptly ignored. And that is a mistake. And this is a mistake that you see replicated again and again and again in computer security. Years ago, uh, you had a lot of people that were really focused on locking down their servers. And then Marcus Random came up with the first widespread toolkit for creating firewalls. And then immediately people said, well, we don't need to patch our computer systems or lock off the services because the firewall will protect us. And then we had intrusion detection and intrusion prevention, and that's going to protect us. And then we had using virtualization. We don't necessarily have to worry about all the problems that we had about keeping our infrastructure up to date because now we'll use virtualization and that's going to make everything great whenever we use something like Zen or we're using Citrix, we don't have to worry about it, and that's still a problem. So anytime in computer security, when you're looking forward into the future, and people say, we don't have to worry about having long passwords anymore. We don't have to worry about enumeration of user IDs and passwords anymore because we have two-factor authentication. You're missing the point. All of these old axioms of computer security are still in play. You still have to have good long passwords. You still have to have user ID, password enumeration is something to be very difficult to achieve in your apps. Let me explain why. So if we look at the ability to harvest user IDs, if we look at the ability to harvest passwords, as soon as we harvest a number of user IDs, there are a tremendous number of toolkits that are out there today that will allow you to bypass things like two-factor authentication. Once again, many organizations are putting all of their eggs in the two-factor authentication basket. And to be honest, whenever we're attacking like OA or we're attacking Google, it's not that hard to get by. Let, let me explain. So this is a tool that was created by Bull Bullock and You Stay Ready, or Mike Felch at Black Hills Information Security, specifically for trying to spearfish successfully two-factor authentication for Google Apps domains. So if you have the victim, the victim uh, receives a calendar inject. So let me show you what the calendar, well, oh, do I have it? Oh, I must have gotten rid of that slide. Google has a vulnerability in it that I can send you a calendar invite and it'll immediately go to your calendar. Regardless of whether or not you actually click that link or you accepted that calendar, it's okay because I can send you the calendar invite and I can automatically say that you have accepted that calendar invite and I can put in a little 10 minute warning. So basically 10 minutes before the meeting starts, do a little pop up and let people know that there's this really important meeting. Now what happens next is when you click a link in the email, or not the email, in the calendar invite. It says there's a really important meeting. You've got to look at these documents before you come to this meeting. As soon as you click that link, it'll actually send you into the, this framework. Cred Sniper will take that request. It'll automatically look at the user that clicked that link. It'll then pull down their picture from their Picasa profile which is many times blank, but it doesn't really matter. It'll actually pull that picture and it'll make your login page for Google look exactly like your login page for Google. And you'll enter in your user ID or your email. You'll enter in your password. And we'll capture all of that and then forward it on to Google. And what happens next is really cool your two-factor authentication. Now, based on what type of two-factor authentication you have enabled, like Google Authenticator or an SMS push or U2FA, uh, 
Cred Sniper will basically change the way it's handling that two-factor authentication on your behalf. So if you have just Google Authenticator, it's going to authenticate to Google with your Google two-factor authentication code. If you have an SMS, it's going to do that as well. If you're using something like U2FA, what's interesting is one of the things that Cred Sniper can do is if you're using U2FA, it completely neuters that. And the reason why is the user agent string it uses when it's authenticating to Google is it says, hey, Google, I'm trying to authenticate and I'm an iPad. Google's like, wait a minute, you're an iPad. You don't support U2FA. I'm not even gonna try to do U2FA because you and the iPad do not support U2FA at all and it's gonna allow you to authenticate. Now, what happens next is really interesting. In addition to doing all of that, bypassing two-factor authentication and gaining access, it'll also create a rule in your inbox for your Google account that will filter any security messages that you may have received. So you know whenever you try to log in to Google from another device, it'll say you're trying to log in from another device, it'll give you that security warning. It'll automatically filter out those security warnings and it'll also create a Google app password that'll give us more persistent backdoor access without actually having to use two-factor authentication at all. So it's great that we have things like two-factor authentication, but once again, we get back to that core problem. If I can enumerate user IDs and if I could possibly enumerate passwords, all of these different attacks that were old are still new and can still be used against you today. So Cred Sniper simplified, sets up a phishing server, captures 2FA, gives you the ability to bypass U2FA, suppresses all Google security alerts, creates an app password, allows you to pillage and start pulling those files down. And then everything is connected to Google. And this is something that you will find out more and more as you start moving to a cloud-based security like approach. Google will tie into GitHub. Google will tie into Mavenly. Google will tie into DocuSign and DocHub and all of these different products that you're using. Google will become that centralized single sign-on authority for the rest of those. So if you gain access to one of them, it is then something that you can very easily then pivot and gain access to everything else. And the problem with this, the big problem with this, is the amount of alerting and notification that we have in services like Google apps for domains is pretty abysmal. We don't have nearly the visibility that we even have today in many Active Directory environments. Now, of course, you can pay more money to Google and you can get additional visibility and that's fantastic and that's great, but even that level of visibility is pretty much lacking. Talk about CASBs a little bit later, but they'll give you the ability to kind of do things like handle encryption keys. They'll give you the ability to handle single sign-on. They'll give you a lot of the security features that you want in a cloud environment for authenticating to multiple different cloud services. But it's entirely interesting to me that there's full market segments that are being created simply because of the lack of notification, the lack of alerting, lack of logging that exists in these cloud service providers that exist today. Let's move on. A very special heads up. If you're going to be attacking very large vendors like Google or Microsoft as part of a security assessment for your own internal team, Google does not like this. And to be honest, neither does Microsoft. Something about violating their terms of service, which is a much longer conversation that requires beer. And it gets into a much larger issue, but I'll, I'll explain that here in just a second. And it's not uncommon if you're launching these types of attacks to test your own organization, that Google will ban you, it will ban any other IP addresses or assume any other accounts associated with your IP address for your family, your pets, and everything at your location. So the point is, as Deadpool would say, angering Fortune 100 companies can in fact have consequences. So be very careful about how you're going to do that. Now let's talk about the much larger issue. The big issue that I see as a penetration tester, especially when we're looking at cloud infrastructure and how people are adopting it so quickly, is how limiting all of these cloud companies are for any security assessment services to happen. We're going back to the days, and to be honest, we still see Oracle handle things this way from time to time, where they say, no, 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 trust us. We're a very large corporation, and we have the best security people in the world, and there's absolutely nothing that you should worry about, plebe. And they want to completely shut down any level of security analytics and any security testing that would be done. And this actually makes sense because you don't want 150 pen tests going against your entire infrastructure that is shared across thousands of different customers and millions of people that are using those services. So it becomes a problem because we're now testing a shared medium and how do we go about testing that shared medium? Number one, to make sure that it's secure. Number two, to make sure that the testing is being done in such a way that it's transparent. And number three, that the very large scale organization just isn't saying trust us and doing absolutely nothing to actually make the problems better because their number one concern is PR, much 
less down that list is actually securing things. Not necessarily saying that's the case with Google, but you get the idea. All right, moving on. So what lessons have we learned from watching bad movies and how does this actually apply to dealing with cloud infrastructure? Well, there's a whole bunch of really bad movies on sci-fi uh, that uh, cover things like Sharktopus versus Dino Shark or Sharknado and all of these crazy, crazy movies. And if we go back even further, if we go back to Godzilla, you had Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, Mothra versus Godzilla. And the only thing that I've learned from watching these really horrific movies is if you have a very large monster, the only thing that you can do is actually turn another very large monster against that monster to be able to attack and take down that monster. So how exactly would we do this if we're dealing with cloud infrastructures? One of the tools that was also written by Mike Felch is a tool called CredKing. And what CredKing allows you to do is do password spraying via Amazon or Amazon Lambda functions. And the reason why this is important is this is kind of like taking those big monsters and turning those monsters against each other. Because if you tried to password spray directly against Google, once again, Google is going to take umbrage with that, and they're probably going to start shutting you down, and they're going to get very angry, as they probably should, right? Especially if they're not notified of what's going on, or you you have a customer, or your internal organization isn't being transparent, communicating with them. They're going to get angry, and they should get angry, and they should block those IP addresses. So if you're a tester and you're trying to test this, one of the things you can do is bounce all of your scans for trying to enumerate user IDs and passwords through Amazon Lambda. That's where you're taking Amazon and now you're turning it against Google. And what we've discovered is by and large, Google won't blacklist Amazon. They won't blacklist Microsoft. Microsoft won't blacklist Google. Even though they're competitors, if they start just blacklisting each other, it's not just going to hurt that specific tester or that specific assessment that you're doing. It's actually going to impact the entire operations between those organizations because many organizations and our customers are hybrid. They're not just completely beholden to Amazon or to Google or to Azure. They'll have services that exist all over the place. And if you start blocking one from communicating with the other, it's going to really impact operations. So we can use that to test against each other because there's a lot of whitelisting and trust that's being done there. So you can go through, create a password, something like spring 2018 or uh, let's say winter 2019 now, and then you can try that password against the user IDs that were harvested earlier that we discussed. And then it'll rotate through the IP addresses and even locations through Amazon Lambda. So this makes it very easy when we're trying to test cloud services to enumerate those user IDs and then enumerate those passwords as well. So the point of all of this is we still have a large number of people, and Jake and I talk about this all the time at SANS conferences, where they get completely bent out of shape over like Rowhammer, some kind of new cutting edge attack that just shows up and everybody freaks out. And it'll be like a zero day for something. And everyone's like, oh my God, there's a zero day. We need to fix this zero day. And they freak out. And that's not what really is going to get your organization at the end of the day. If you're spending all of your time worrying about the latest cutting edge technical hack du jour, you're missing the point because I don't need an iPhone zero day. The only thing I need to know is that one of the people that we're trying to break into, their user ID is easy to enumerate and their password is furries forever. These are the types of vulnerabilities that existed years ago. These are the vulnerabilities that Clifford Stoll talked about. These are the vulnerabilities that still exist today. And Jake is going to talk extensively about a lot of the vulnerabilities that have worked forever and how those vulnerabilities are still working. And some of them, he's going to beg and plead you for the love of God to shut off services and do some very basic and rudimentary things. And those same concepts of hygiene also apply in cloud computing as well. Next tool, Mail Sniper. Uh, this is one of those tools that uh, predominantly is used for bypassing Outlook Web Access to factor authentication. Uh, if you have somebody that's using Outlook Web Access, many times they'll have Outlook Web Access, they'll have two-factor authentication for Outlook Web Access, that's great. But then Exchange Web Services on the back end completely allows you to log in with no two-factor authentication at all. And Mail Sniper will take advantage of that. And that's cool. And that would be great if that's all that Mail Sniper did. There's a lot more, and this kind of gets into some hygiene, and I'm kind of moving a little bit into some of the stuff that uh, Jake is going to be talking about on internal networks. But the other thing that Mail Sniper does that many people are not aware of and many people aren't even looking at is it also allows you to find inboxes where users have over-delegated their permissions. Um, for example, let's say you're a very important CEO of a corporation, <clears throat> and you need to have an executive assistant who's going to review all of your mail. That's great. You can delegate responsibility for your inbox to your executive assistant. So unfortunately, 
for many organizations, the way that they delegate their responsibilities, they make it so everyone has access to their email. So that means that anyone that wants to go in and check on their email can. Mail Sniper has the ability to search through all of the email inboxes once you have access to an account, of course, captured through user ID and password harvesting. Once you get logged in, then you can search for inboxes. And it's not uncommon for us to find 50, 60, even 100 inboxes for many legacy organizations that have been around for a long time where you can now go directly into their email and you can start searching for certain strings. You can search for strings like passwords or Sasquatch or ice cream or whatever you can think of, right? Top secret, whatever it is. And you can start pulling down every single email in the email boxes that you have access to. And then you can start reading those emails. And this is important for me for a number of reasons. We have a large number of tools that are doing analysis and they're looking for shares, right? They're looking for files on shares. Like if we're looking at PowerShell, Empire, Share Finder, and File Finder, we can search through an entire like share list, a whole bunch of shares that are mounted on that workstation that that workstation has access to, and we can look for passwords. And that's great, that's awesome. But a lot of the different security products that are out there today are actually starting to detect that type of activity. And what we've discovered is very few of the products that are out there are detecting anything at all whenever all of a sudden you're just searching through email. And the reason why? Well, searching through email is kind of what your email does all of the time. So this creates an entire pathway to identify sensitive files because everything that's sensitive in your organization is going to be in email, right? It's not necessarily in a file share, but it's gonna be in an email and it allows us to find those sensitive documents. It allows us to find the password files that the administrators are sharing with each other and making it very easy to do so. Next up, Azure. Whoa, okay, so Azure, this was weird. So Bo and Mike, a lot of these things are coming from Bo and Mike. Um, in this particular webcast, we have some other tools that we're going to talk about next week on Tuesday, uh, like Powerline by uh, uh, by Brian Furman, a whole bunch of other tools that we're going to be discussing. But for this, when we're talking about cloud, it's been Brian and Mike have been doing a tremendous amount of research in this specific area. Well, a while back, they asked for one week. They said, we want to look at Azure and one of our customers, we're working very closely with a customer, and we want to spend one week and we want to look at Azure CLI. We want to look at PowerShell for Azure. We want to look at these things and see what we can do. And we were just absolutely floored. From the internet, not accessing an internal system and pivoting, but from the internet, if you have a valid user account, once again, captured through user ID, password, spring, you can then pull all the users, all the groups, group membership, service principal names, applications, and any user via Azure Active Directory can also add additional guest users so you can create more persistent accounts on a system. It's not, you don't even have to be a domain administrator to do that. A standard user can be like, eh, here's a guest account for Bill. And then Bill has the same level of access as well. This is one week of research. And what floors me about this is just how complicated the ecosystems are whenever you're looking at cloud computing and spending one week looking at something like Azure, which is a fairly big marquee name, Azure Active Directory, and being able to find something where we can enumerate a tremendous amount of data from an organization, it, it terrifies me because we're a small security firm based out of South Dakota. And one week we can start finding these things that can then be greatly leveraged and used to attack organizations. This scares me because that's one component. If you look on the screen, there is a tremendous number of components that are out there. So we need, as a security community, to start vetting a lot of these components and not necessarily trusting that Microsoft did it right, not necessarily trusting that Amazon did it right, not necessarily trusting that Google did it right. There has to be that whole concept of security of trust, but verify. We see what happens with some vendors where they just say, trust us. And if we blindly trust them, it doesn't end well. So I also believe that the browser is the new endpoint. I really strongly believe this because if you're looking at how many security testing firms look at security assessments, they look at it in terms of get malware on a workstation. And all of these different EDR products and next, next, next generation AV products are starting to get fairly good at detecting and stopping malware once it's on a workstation. But 90% of what you do is in the browser. So just giving you an example, that one week that Bo and Mike did. So Outlook add-ins, all right? This is something that Bo did a tremendous amount of work with manifest.xml files. So you can get creds, log into somebody's Office 365 account. Then you can add in a plugin for their email. And then that add-in will sync everywhere, not just in Office 365 through their browser, but if they're using something like Outlook, it'll also sync that plugin 
onto their email client that they're using. So the other thing to remember is the Outlook desktop client actually uses Edge. So you can start creating browser-based hooks like Beef to basically hook a browser every single time somebody reads an email. Or you can have Book hook the Outlook desktop client every single time someone reads an email. You can harvest credentials. You can do almost anything you want that you would normally do with a browser plugin or a browser hook via cross-site scripting. You can now do that via email. So uh, there's great, great kind of write-up on this that Bo did talking about it. But I want you to think a little bit about some additional plugins that some of you have in your browser. And then look at this as something that you can start creating on your own. For example, Grammarly. Grammarly will find all of the misspellings that I have, which trust me is a tremendous. There's so, so many misspellings, you guys. Um, Grammarly will look at everything I type and it'll tell me, hey, you misspelled that. Or I'll say your grammar is wrong on that. And that's great, and I love that service, but Grammarly is a key logger. It's logging everything that I type, and it's sending it somewhere out in the cloud. Now, that's a quote-unquote good key logger. It'd be very easy for you to generate and write another key logger that would just capture everything off of your browser. LastPass is also very similar. LastPass monitors every page you go to, every input field that you have. It's constantly monitoring everything and then wanting to like, hey, I just saw that you entered something that looks like a user ID and password. Are you sure you don't want to add that up here? Once again, not necessarily a keylogger, but look at the power that these plugins actually have. So if you want to kind of further your career in information security, I would recommend, one, looking at cloud services, not trying to hack them, but just try to enumerate what you can do with those cloud services via the APIs and start publishing your research because there's going to be people that are going to stand on your shoulders and they're going to find amazing vulnerabilities. And then if you're looking to actually start writing malware or starting to come up with new ways to test malware in your organization, start looking at these browser plugins because they're just fantastic. All right, let's talk about why this matters. Many of these attacks are not straightforward. If you're looking at something like Cred Sniper, if you're looking at something like Cred King, it takes us setting up a framework. It takes us creating a number of servers, standing up these servers, logging into systems in Amazon, setting up the Lambda instances. It requires a little bit of setup. But having to do like a Tennessee two step instead of just a one step it makes it so it's devastatingly effective. And also, it makes it so many of the vendors don't fix these core issues. Many of these core issues have existed since like 1996. They're not going to fix them. Why? Because of Josh Wright's law. Josh Wright has this law where he basically said vendors will not patch or fix a vulnerability until there is a Metasploit plugin or Metasploit exploit that'll actively take advantage and exploit that particular vulnerability. And from what we've seen, He's right. A lot of the things that I've discussed so far, this is basically our go-to. We use this constantly to get remote access to environments effectively and consistently, and it's not being fixed because it's not something that can be simply dropped into a Metasploit exploit. So that's why this matters. This, this cloud thing is crazy. We need to embrace it as security professionals and not simply look at it and say, well, the cloud is stupid. It's somebody else's computer. Whether it's dumb or not is completely irrelevant to all of us in security. We're the ones that are going to be left to actually fix it. So what else can you do? Azure Security Center. With Azure, they have this wonderful security center that will imp implement a large amount of user behavioral and entity analytics into a dashboard, and it'll also, also log into your existing SIM infrastructure. And that is huge, right? This is giving us the visibility that we need into Azure Cloud that many of us don't even have in our current Active Directory environments. So I'd strongly recommend looking at Azure Security Center for a lot of the different Azure components. But this is where it starts to get a little frustrating. You have Azure Security Center, great, awesome, let's do that. But in addition to Azure Security Center, you also have Office 365 Cloud App Security. And last time I checked, these are completely independent of each other. You can have one log into the other, of course, but as far as the plugins and what they do for user behavioral and entity analytics, they are standalone. They are both amazing and you should turn them on without question, turn them on. In fact, at Black Hills Information Security for Office 365 infrastructure, we have turned this on. It's $3 a month per user and it's well worth it. I mean, it adds up, of course, with the number of users, but it's well worth it because it gives you things like Activity from an anonymous IP address, inappropriate login, activity from a non, uh, from a not nor normally unused country. It'll give you that user behavioral analytics, like logging in and then no activity, that is so sorely missing 
and a tremendous amount of the cloud infrastructures that we are actually testing today. And once again, this goes back to a tremendous number of organizations have next, next, next generation security products, products protecting their endpoints, but then everything they have in the cloud is like completely wide open. We just have to harvest user IDs, passwords, and then use them somewhere in that cloud infrastructure. Also, cloud access security brokers. This is, this is a concern of mine. I think that we all need to be looking at that. If you have multiple cloud components, you need to be looking into products like Forcepoint, Sky High Networks, Bitglass, Netscope. You need to be looking in these products. And, and this is going to sound weird. I think it's important you look at these products, but the fact that these products exist at all make me very uncomfortable. And I worry about their ability to keep up. Let, let me explain. Many of these products exist because the cloud infrastructures that are out there, the cloud services that you're going to use, are so horrible at security that somebody has stood up an entire class of products for our cloud providers sucking at security, at logging, at doing key escrow, handling encryption properly. So many organizations have to go out and buy a third-party product to ride on top of that. And the reason why this concerns me is if the core logs and analysis are not there, it makes it very hard for these products to be effective, number one. Number two, if you're looking at cloud infrastructures and APIs, web application firewalls for different uh, APIs that will exist out there, you are running it smack into a problem where the technology is advancing so rapidly that the security technology is having a hard time keeping up. And this is something that John talked about at the beginning of this presentation. There's this rapid adoption of new technologies, and in security, we have to keep up. Many of the vendors that are writing the technologies that will allow us to keep up are about two to three years behind at a minimum. So it's going to take a while for this entire market to start settling down to the point where we actually start getting good telemetry. We start getting good application API level firewall and working the way that it should. We start getting good user behavioral and entity analytics, not just for one gateway coming into one service provider in the cloud, but correlating that across multiple different um, cloud entities that would exist. Like, for example, if you're dealing with like Microsoft Azure, you may have great security in Office 365, but then you stand up SharePoint and all the security that you had and all the visibility that you had is now gone. Or if you're attacking an organization, you harvest user IDs and passwords, then you can move over to Doc Hub, put in that account, user ID and password and gain access to their Doc Hub account, independent of even being, being authenticated to Gmail in this scenario. So this is a bad problem because we never got the core concept concepts in place on the inside of the environment, and now we're moving things into the cloud, and the cloud is evolving much, much, much faster than we can actually keep up. So closing thoughts, we are not ready for the cloud. We were not ready for the cloud. We're continuing to be unready for the cloud, but what the hell? We're going to put our most sensitive assets, and we're going to drop them straight up on the internet. And by the way, this is a bad idea. But our job as, secu as security professionals is to work with the environments that we have. We're not necessarily going to stop innovation. And John mentioned that at the beginning. We cannot stifle and close off in innovation in businesses. They're going to continue marching forward. We're going to have to try to extend security features that we should have internally to our external cloud resources. And of course, I recommend test everything. Push against our cloud service providers to get the level of testing that we need to do to try to make sure that these things are in fact secure. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jake. Hey, thanks so much, John. That that, that was uh, that was phenomenal. And you know, I I want to pivot uh, actually back to something that uh, that John one said uh, in his uh, in his piece at the beginning there. Um, you know, J John mentioned uh, that uh, John Pescator mentioned that uh, uh, you know there's there's really a uh, uh, you know really a lot of stuff that we can do from a security perspective that doesn't cost a lot of money. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this as as we go through. Um, although it's not the explicit focus of of the session here. But, but there's so much in, involved with security culture. Um, and, you know, if we've got some time in the q and I'd, I'd love to come back to this. But, but you know, the uh, culture of security organizations, uh, we just got done penetration testing, a, uh, a penetration testing, a financial institution. I uh, just flew back from there yesterday, actually. And, you know, I, I you know, as I'm, I'm working with a security team there, um, it was really interesting to, uh, to see the, uh, you know, the way that they've integrated uh, with their security culture, you know, all the way through IT. Nobody worries about, uh, both in IT and IT security, you know, there's a focus on, and they know uh, that the board, all the way down from the board down, their number two priority um, is is security. Number one, of course, is is keeping the business operational, um, but but number two is security, right? So there, there's no confusion about that, and and you know that that's something that costs no money to do, 
um, everybody there knows that that's just part of their job. And in fact, not just part of, but but actually a priority. If they're prioritizing something above that, they're just doing it wrong. And you know, there, that's something that costs no money to do. It, it's literally just a culture change. Um, so, so, you know, kind of leading into that, I want to mention here that, that most of the stuff I'm going to talk about here today is, is stuff that you can do for little or no money um, at all, right? So a lot of this is just configuration changes. Um, look, uh, if you've been following me for a while, I hope most of this is not going to be new to you. Um, I will also tell you that, uh, you know, that, uh, again, a lot of people aren't doing this stuff. Uh, you know, I remember chatting with uh, John Strand, uh, gosh, probably uh, two, three, two years ago, uh, I guess, as uh, the 2016 campaign was going. Um, you know, John's like, man, I'd love to get some make pen testing great again hats, right? And I, I'm thinking to myself, yes, yes, make pen testing great again, right? Um, make, make it suck, um, you know, for, for the attacker, that is, right? And likewise, obviously, if you're doing that and making it suck for the attacker, uh, for the red teamer, you're making it suck for the real attacker as well. So, so with that, let, let's let's jump on here and, and talk a little bit about uh, you know a little bit about what we're seeing and, and and some of things you can do to make the attacker's job suck worse. Um, logging. I don't think there's anybody here that's saying no, no, no logging. We shouldn't do that. Um, it's 2018 though. Should I still be talking about this? Yeah, it turns out uh, totally right. Um, to John's point, uh, John Strand's point. Um, you know, the cloud services are probably some of my biggest sources of logging fails, right? People make this move to O365 and, and look, uh, you know, good news, Microsoft's patching all that stuff for you and you don't have to deal with, you don't have to deal with all the crazy of, uh, basically all the crazy of keeping your exchange server up to date and all that. Um, that said, which by the way is a huge problem in some of our penetration tests, um, that, that said, uh, you're losing a lot of logging with it, right? Now, if you pay the extra, uh, for the security center, like John's talking about, I mean, great, that's awesome. But you know, this this cloud services in general, we find that we don't have a lot of logging. Um, I'll tell you that uh, not just cloud services, but on prem as well. Every incident response we arrive at, people say, "Yep, we've got logging." But I got to tell you, man, when we start asking for, okay, great, let's go pull those logs. Um, I just hear a sad trombone playing in the background. It, it, it's it's really really nasty. This guy here is running with a trombone. He uh, he actually looks a little happier than than I am most of the time when I ask for logs. Um, and, and so my solution to this is something called a CMF or a collection management framework. Um, now, you know, if, if you follow me, you know that I come out of old intelligence and collection management framework is something that uh, comes out of intelligence as well, but, but I think applies very, very well uh, to uh, very, very well to InfoSec. Um, you know, this is something that uh, some people have in one form or another uh, without calling it this. Great if you've got it. And if you don't, um, this is a, a takeaway, a, a great uh, homework project for you. Uh, to get done, and I'll challenge you to get one of these done before the end of the year. List your logging data sources. Well, what type of data is being logged in the first place, right? Uh, people are like, it's an event log. Well, okay, great, yeah, but what's your auditing settings uh, set up? What questions can you answer with the data? Where are the logs stored? Who has access? Um, what's the retention policy for the data? And this one's huge at the bottom. Can retention be increased for an incident, and if so, by how much? Do you actually have flex space in your SIM uh, to say, yeah, we need to go ahead and, and retain uh, you know, a particular logging source longer. Do I have the legal framework available to do that? Talk to general counsel. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, during an incident, and, and we've worked a number of these where uh, we roll into a, a roll into an incident. Uh, we, uh, as we roll in, you know, we find out they've got, uh, let's say six months of net flow. Um, we're at uh, five months and 23 days, right? Uh, five months and 28 days, right? Wh whatever the case is, 180 day retention. We're at day 178. What now? Right. Um, look, uh, you know, as, as far as uh, day 178, based on what we know today. Right. Well, OK, do I do I stop logging new data? Uh, can I extend the uh, the lifetime of that uh, of that data? H how much room do I have to flex? And you want to know this ahead of time, know this before the incident. And of course, you can plan around this. Um, look, uh, CMF reviews. Uh, this is huge, too. Don't just build it. You got to have it available, uh, ready to go and, and actually make sure it's up to date. And I got to tell you that the biggest one that, that we're dealing with here is our actual retention is not in line with projected retention, meaning we architected a system for 180 days of, of let's say, log retention. And I've architected it for 180 days, but the reality is that you know uh, bandwidth is increasing over time, utilization is increasing over time. And, and what we're seeing then is that it's no longer 180 days, it's, it's really 150 days, right? I engineered that uh, full tape packet capture for a month uh, of retention and I'm really getting two and a half weeks, right? Um, this, this is huge, and we want to know that uh, to avoid some coulda, woulda, shouldas uh, on the back end. Now, I'm going to use my ticketing system to go and set in scheduled tasks, uh, whether that's ServiceNow or 
or God forbid remedy or, or whatever it is that you're using, right? Um, look, uh, the reality is here, if you set up these uh, set up these tickets, Jira, whatever, uh, basically you'll get reminders in to go back and revalidate your CMF. And, and by the way, um, if you're not using interns and InfoSec today, you are doing it wrong. This is a great place to get uh, junior employees from. Uh, I certainly at Rendition uh, have hired a number of folks out of, uh, out of internships um, and, and have a couple more that we're planning on doing that with, uh, with now. Um, so again, huge way to a uh, huge way to go there. By, by the way, don't abuse your interns here, you know, paid internships, not like volunteer stuff here. Um, but, uh, you know, it, these are great for interns, right? Your, your interns, uh, you know, uh, can review this and basically go in and, and they're learning about the logging sources simultaneously. It's mutually beneficial. And let's be fair. Um, th this is not the kind of work that I enjoy doing day in, day out. It's going and saying, okay, well, it says 180 days. Do I really have 180 days still, right? That kind of stuff. But, but again, interns eat this stuff up. You get huge benefit out of it. This is just good stuff. Now, look, I have to talk about, and I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the CSI cyber effect. Let's be real about this. Your CEO is disappointed that CSI cyber was canceled, right? She watched it every week, loved it. I uh, love to watch the whole red code, right? And then we've seen the red code, green code thing, or NCIS with two idiots, one keyboard, right? Look, uh, your CIO thinks Scorpion is good television, and, and no doubt about it, man, your board of directors thinks Live Free or Die Hard. That was a documentary to them, right? They're like, yeah, yeah. And look, it's funny to laugh about this stuff, but but again, uh, working in uh, you know working in security like we do, and doing a lot of consulting with different organizations, I can tell you that people really think this way, right? Um, now, live free or die hard being a documentary, I think most people know it wasn't, um, but uh, they they wonder how close. They don't know how far from reality that is, and and there's a lot of when we talk about the CSI cyber effect, there's a lot of the I saw it on TV and it took them 42 minutes. Right to uh, investigate and catch the bad guy and pistol whip him in the street. Um, you know, like why is it taking you weeks to to work on this incident and you don't have all the answers that uh, you know that Abby on NCIS did, right? And of course, you know, the, the reality there is that their expectations uh, aren't, aren't going to match, uh, of course, the the reality of of, of the incident. And so I want to use my collection management framework to work with my management before an incident because let's be fair, I, I never have all the collection I want as a security professional. I am log hungry. Right, um, you know, doing incident response, uh, investigating these incidents, uh, trying to identify, you know, some of the weirdness that, that uh, John and his teams are pulling off, and certainly our red teams as well. Um, you know, again, I I'm looking for these logs here, and I want to take my stakeholders through through the incidents and the headlines and say, look, um, here's the deal. You know, here's this breach uh, that we know some uh, some details about. Equifax is a great one because uh, there's been so much published on that. Um, some of the uh, government accountability reports are certainly uh, very interesting there. And so I like to look at the questions that my investigators uh, could and couldn't answer in those breaches. How much data was likely required to answer? Now, look, you don't have the full incident response reports in most cases, so, so we have to do some triage here, right? We have to come in and, and fill in some of the gaps, right? But, but if you make good assumptions about these, it's still a very useful exercise and say, look, you know, this is, this is what we expect to see, right? This is uh, what we would have expected we would need to answer these questions. Um, do we have the data to answer it? And if so, what's our mean time to detection? Because my friends, I got to tell you, if your mean time to detection is, is 60 days, right? Uh, bear in mind that's your mean, that, that's your average. Uh, look, if, if my mean time to detection is 60 days and I've only got 75 days of logging, do I need to increase my retention? If my mean time to detection is 90 days and I've only got, uh, let's say, 21 days of full take packet capture, do I need to adjust my retention? Right. And again, we can answer these questions up front. Now, now, look, I'm certainly not going to tell you you need a year of full take packet capture of the egress. I mean, man, that would be nice. But no, I've never seen it. Right. Not not in a uh, production enterprise environment. Um, but I do want to walk through uh, with my management and say, look, here's the questions they could answer. Here's what they couldn't answer. Here's how our collection stacks up. And if you want to be able to answer these questions right uh, at, a, at breach time, um, understand that this is what we're going to need to put in place. By the way, here's the cost. Now, a lot of people balk at this. They're like, oh, this is this is a lot of work and my executives don't want to hear this and they don't want to take time. Brother, believe me, particularly, I'll tell you who wants to hear all about this is chief risk. Your chief risk officer is living for this stuff. And by and large, when we do these with customers, our chief risk officers have never done these before with their organizations. Go in, talk to chief risk, right? Because chief risk, that's their job is to sign off on risk. It's the job of the board, of course, to do this as well, but, but chief risk ultimately is going to advise the board of directors about that. Look, if I can do this, if I can go in and, and structure this uh, in, in a way where they understand what they're giving up if they don't uh, 
you know, if they, if they don't increase retention, if they don't turn on this logging setting, if we don't adopt this other uh, detective control or detective or investigative control, this is a huge win for me. And on the back end, it's not a question of what did you do wrong that we couldn't detect this, that we couldn't go back this far, right? So, so I actually absolutely want to make sure that I've got that, uh, that I've got that level set of expectations with my executives. Moving on, log review. This is another one, man. This it's like sticking a knife in, just sticking a knife in my gut and twisting it, right? Because I feel like this is '90s advice: do log review, right? Um, look, I'll tell you that uh, in most of the incidents we work, when we do root cause analysis, where breaches were missed. Um, and, and look, you don't have to look far in public reporting to see that this happens a lot. Target is a great example uh, where they had all the data available. They just didn't act on it, right? Why didn't they act on it? I suspect because they didn't know what they were looking for, right? Um, there's two root causes that we find in our investigations for why was this missed with, with log review. Um, system admins think they don't need to do it, right? That, that, that's number one. Um, they go back and they read the control, whether it's uh, or read the, the standard, whether it's PCI, um, you know, or, or you name it, throw, throw insert standard here, and they know they need to do log review. They know that somebody needs, to, let's back up there and say somebody needs to do log review. They're like, who better to do log review than InfoSec? Well, no, InfoSec is not who should be doing log review, right? Um, InfoSec should be monitoring the SEM, but I tell you who knows those logs, who knows the systems better than anybody else, that, that's, that's system administrators, period, right? Uh, look, if my system admins know that there's a, my security team in a large Fortune 500 organization does not know this particular database server only has three admins. And oh, by the way, Bob, he was on vacation. Uh, he's actually on a cruise ship right now. Uh, Bob's logging in uh, legitimately. Um, look, if, if my system admins who know that Bob's on a cruise ship and doesn't have internet access, um, if they know that, that he's taking, you know, that's the case, um, this isn't gonna fire an alert on the SEM, right? This is something that, uh, again, you know, my security team just isn't gonna understand. So again, my system admins have better understanding of the systems, better understanding of situational awareness around these systems than InfoSec ever will, and they should know what an attack looks like, but that brings me to number two. System admins don't know what they're looking for by and large. I ask when people say, anytime we're doing an assessment, I always ask, you doing daily log review? And I hear the answer, oh yeah, yeah. They, they know the right answer, right? It's kind of like, you know, the uh, you go up to TSA and they're like, hey, did you a terrorist? And, or, or for instance, did you, did you pack your own bags? Right? Everybody knows the right answer to that, right? Even the terrorists know the answer to that. And, and system admins do too. Did you do log review? Yes, 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 I did log review. And I say, what are you looking for? And they always come back and say, well, you know. I'm like, no, I don't. They're like, well, well, you know, it's uh, ha hackers and, and, and badness. And I'm like, what does a hacker look like? And they're like, hey, you, you know what a hacker looks like. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I do, but I'm not confident that, that everybody in the room does, right? Um, go ahead and tell me what you're looking for. And right? tell you what, better yet, my mom's NDA'd with our, uh, with our company. She actually is an executive. She does a lot of executive review, not an executive of my company, but does a lot of executive review uh, for uh, an executive review for uh, uh, basically our, our, a lot of our reports that, that we deliver. Um, great to get uh, get rid of that curse of knowledge. But I say, hey, look, you know, we'll, we'll put her on the phone with, uh, you know, with you guys. You walk her through what you're looking for. If you can tell my mom how to find hackers in the logs, game on, right? 100% sure you can tell, uh, you, you know what you're looking for, right? You can tell my intern how to do this in the logs. We know what we're looking for. Frequently, they can't. They, they don't know really what they're looking for. Now, I've got somebody, worst case, if they're not lying to me, if they're actually doing log review, this is absolutely worthless. This is like somebody that doesn't know how to, I mean, seriously, if, if you put this into perspective, the, the word hacker, the word breach, these do not appear in our event logs. They don't appear in our sys logs. They don't appear all over. We have to know what we're looking for. This is like somebody who doesn't know how to do C++ coding, doing an app code review, right? I mean, if you don't know how to program, what are you actually looking at? Yes, you scrolled through the source code, but we don't understand what we're doing. Okay, this is a big one here. LLMNR, turn it off. Link layer multicast name resolution is a dumpster fire that never should have been enabled by default. Um, I, I could do a whole webcast on, on all the stupidity around this. If you're in a Microsoft environment, just turn it off, write me out, right? Uh, it's man in the middle for the win. And, and again, there is in, in average, I, I am yet to see an organization uh, anywhere that's needed this. LLMNR largely replaces NetBIOS. Um, a couple of way, 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 way old uh, orgs uh, and, and way old architectures uh, still rely on some NetBIOS today and some legacy devices. But man, let, let's be honest, LLMNR uh, came in with Vista, never should have been a thing. It's on by default, turn it off. What about a egress ACLs? My goodness, enable these. This is free. You already have the architecture to do this. Um, this is 100% free. 
uh, turn it on, block ICMP outbound. You do not need to ping things on the open internet. And if you do, uh, allow it for uh, the one or two network admins that have a need. Notice I use the word need, not desire because I, I felt like it because it might be cool sometime, but a need to ping something or send some other ICMP message uh, outbound. Uh, I can't imagine what that other ICMP message would be, but but cool. Uh, we're seeing attackers uh, like the Chinese, uh, you know, a couple of the Chinese APT groups um, are using ICMP tunneling. Well, I, I don't want that. John teaches that in Sec 504, for goodness sakes, right? Uh, ICMP tunneling. Again, we, we don't we don't need this. Turn it off. Uh, FTP and SSH, right? Uh, I use SSH in for post exploitation in practically every pen test that we do. We bring along a customized version of Drop Bear. It's outstanding. Um, look, uh, you know, good, good there. Uh, FTP and SSH turn this off as well, except for specific external servers that you know you have a need to talk to. DNS, right? Another big one that John talks about in Sec 504 is, is DNS. Um, this is a DNS cat, right? So, so we're looking at the DNS tunneling. Um, SMTP and Western Mail Server, right? Again, um, we want to turn this off as well. And and uh, this is a great spot where not only are we going to turn this off, but listen. Uh, if you start seeing hosts trying to talk DNS, uh, they're either misconfigured or they, it's a security incident. That's it. See somebody try an SSH? Uh, you know, again, we've got a change control. We've got a security incident. We've got to, uh, look, I, I want to actually not just turn this on and block, but I actually want to log this and alert on this, right? Because some of the time it's going to be an IT operations problem. But but again, that that's part of our job as well in security. Private VLANs. Uh, private VLANs make my job suck when I'm doing red team. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how many breaches would have been absolutely neutered uh, and cut off at the uh, cut off at the pass if we'd used uh, if we'd used private VLANs. These are strict communications inside a VLAN. They confuse attackers because I, I can't talk from workstation to workstation anymore, which is desirable. There's no reason that we should ever do this, right? No reason that we need a workstation to talk to another workstation. If your workstation needs to talk to another workstation, that other workstation is uh, hosting a service and and. And last time I checked, that makes it a, a, a server, not a workstation, right? Move that service into the server room, right? Uh, you know, John talked a little bit earlier about uh, micro, uh, micro architectures and micro segmentation. Um, again, th this is a great opportunity to, you know, if you needed a buzzword to get behind it, then, then by all means do that, but move that stuff out of the workstation subnets, implement private VLANs, um, and, and look, uh, your attackers won't know these are here, and they're going to make a ton of noise trying to figure out uh, that they're there. By the way, you never really get to, you never really get to a, a full uh, from an attacker standpoint. A full, okay, I know for sure I'm in a private VLAN. The, the best you get to is the, I'm pretty sure we're in a private VLAN because I know I just made a bunch of noise and nothing worked that I think should have worked. Right. Want to come up as well and talk about port security? We talk a lot about ARP spoofing uh, and and uh, you know ARP spoofing and doing man in the middle attacks and. And I'll tell you, port security is, is another one of those things you can turn it on in your switch today for free. Uh, it doesn't work on uplink ports. If you've got a conference room where somebody comes in and plugs in uh, to a uh, basically an Ethernet jack, uh, you know, and, and I've got folks running in and out of, of there with their laptops, and port security is not good there, right? And some people are like, well, I can't implement it because I've got these other hosts. And it's like, no, no, stop that, man. we got to stop letting perfect get in the way of good enough, right? Um, if I've got a subnet that, uh, let's say, for my 11th floor that is is 100%, uh, you know, standalone workstations that they're not laptops. Uh, nobody's moving around there uh, and unplugging their machines and plugging a different machine in. Turn port security on there, right? Uh, wherever you can get it, let's go ahead and up that. Uh, let's go ahead and up our security, right? Uh, again, basically here what we're doing is we're saying only one MAC address can communicate on a switch port. Typically, it's only one. Uh, most often, you'll set it up so that it's auto detected, meaning the first MAC that connects the workstation that's plugged in uh, is now the MAC address that can talk down that uh, talk down that switch port or talk to that switch port, um, and that's it, right? So if you help desk techs don't like this because they have to swap out a workstation, they have to get networking involved to go reset port security, right? And I get it, it it's a pain, but but man, it's a huge security uplift and stops me from doing a lot of nasty stuff I want to do. Now, internal network ACLs, your routers, your internal routers support ACLs. We know this, right? Um, here's a big one for me. Do I need TCP 445 into a workstation subnet? I say no, right? Um, now, I know I need to support remote administration, right? But I can restrict by source address. There's very, very few workstations, very few source address, uh, source addresses that should ever talk to uh, should ever be able to talk 445 into a workstation subnet. I combine this with private VLANs, and holy wow, is this an awesome uh, is this an awesome enabler for security, particularly if I'm logging. 
Now, look, a lot of organizations tell me I can't support internal ACLs. We're going to break things. That means you don't have a good baseline. Uh, here's another objection. Too many changes. Uh, that means your change management sucks, right? Uh, I use substandard here because I didn't want to write the word sucks. But yes, uh, look, we can't bother the network team every time system admins need to change something. Man, this is the most concerning one to me. This, this is the this is the you don't get security, right? Because what this tells me is my network team can't be bothered to participate in security ops. They don't like this. My last one here is attackers still find ways to laterally move. Well, no joke. I got it, right? Um, you know, they're still going to move around uh, without bypass or basically without talking through a router ACL on the same subnet, for instance. Okay, neat. Um, but uh, look, uh, I don't care about getting to 100%. I know I'm never going to get to 100%, and, and I'm willing to be. I'm willing to be good enough, right? And don't let perfect stand in the way of good enough. I'm going to tell you that uh, ACLs are a lot of work, but they're going to drive the change control program. What I mean here is if somebody tries to install new software, they try to change uh, IP addresses, all that stuff that's supposed to be in a change management baseline that worked before, with internal ACLs, typically it doesn't work anymore, right? So I've got these internal network ACLs, uh, and because somebody tried to just you know, go around the change control board and stand up that uh, new piece of software, remove that server, et cetera, um, I'm going to get in, one, it's not going to work. That's going to force us to submit a change control ticket. And two, I'm going to start getting alerts about it, and I can handle that from there as well, right? Again, uh, my attackers, though, uh, don't expect these to be in place. Few orgs do this, right? Um, but I'll tell you, as soon as you do this, port scans light up like a Christmas tree. Here, we're, we're taking our attackers' TTPs. We know attackers land via phishing. We know then that they start doing some uh, some scanning, kind of seeing what's around a little bit. Um, and, and again, as soon as they do that, we're lighting up like a Christmas tree because we have internal network ACLs. Most networks, as, as John will tell you, as certainly as I've experienced, um, you know, they're they've got a hard, crunchy outside and a soft, gooey inside. Right. Uh, once you get inside, uh, again, there's not a lot there from a detection standpoint. Um, and, and here again, you know, that that's what you're doing here, setting yourself up for success uh, around that detection once the attacker's already inside the gates. I'm going to throw out here and say enforce SMB signing. This is another big one. We use a lot of uh, SMB relays in our attacks. Basically, here what we're doing is we're proxying uh, authentication uh, and uh, proxying SMB authentication. Uh, very often, the use case here is that we trick a domain admin um, into trying to log on to a workstation that we have uh, that we've pwned. Um, and uh, in doing so, uh, basically, we are as, when I say log in, I mean just do a request, an SMB request, map a file, share, et cetera. Um, and uh, oftentimes do that by submitting a help desk ticket or masquerading, a, you know, phishing as the user, voice phishing as the user, um, and saying, hey, you know, I'm having trouble accessing this file on my local system. I saved it, but now it's saying I don't have permission to access it. Very frequently, they will then create an SMB request, um, often with domain admin credentials, and we proxy that across uh, or relay that across to a server and effectively become them on that server. Um, look, uh, the reality here is that uh, in most cases, you, you can absolutely enable and enforce SMB signing. Now, there's a difference between enabling and enforcing. And enabling it means uh, that uh, enabling it means that that it's supported. Enforcing means that you won't not do it. Um, and, and enforcement's the way you want to go. Just enabling it does very, very little. Enforcing it and saying, hey, no, we're not going to authenticate is, is the way to go. Now, there are some legacy devices this hurts, but the vast majority of them, um, the vast majority of those uh, talk to very, very few hosts in a network. Uh, by all means, uh, you know, enforce it uh, wide and then reset that in the organizational unit. Uh, put those devices that need to speak to legacy device um, in a organizational unit um, and go ahead and reset, uh, basically reset the setting there. Finally, I'll mention uh, mandating the use of NTLM version 2. Configure the machine so they only use this, right? Um, there's very, very few devices in the network today. In most networks today, industrial is, is, an, is a counterexample. Healthcare is a counterexample. Um, but again, only devices that need it uh, support NTLM v1 or, or landman challenge response. Um, attackers spend a lot more time and energy trying to crack NTLM version 2. You're just trying to make the attacker's job harder. And again, you know, th this is another one of these spots where when you enable this, Microsoft says, yeah, you could break some stuff with this. And you can. You definitely can. Um, but, but again, mostly it's legacy devices, right? Um, if you've got some Windows 98 running in your, let's say, your, in your communication center uh, controlling a PPX or whatever, I get it. It doesn't know NTLM v2. Awesome. Um, how many things are talking to that device? That's not a reason to globally not turn this on and mandate. Don't allow the downgrade attack because that's what me and John are doing in our pen test. Um, when you know we get that, uh, when we get that uh, hash, uh, you know, basically as we get uh, somebody to uh, to uh, basically pass as a hash, there we're going to try to set up uh, and try to downgrade to a landman challenge response. 
Uh, failing that, we're gonna go to NTLM version one. Uh, you know, failing that, we're still gonna capture that hash, but it takes a lot more uh, effort to crack offline an NTLM v2 than it does a version one or landman. Privileged account passwords are another one. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have seen, uh, you know, the same local admin password across 10,000 or more workstations. Uh, this is a bad, bad, bad plan. Uh, there's a lot of vendors in the industry today that are, uh, you know, tailoring solutions uh, for local account password management. Uh, great, uh, that's awesome. Uh, look, Laps from Microsoft, uh, local uh, admin or local account password solution um, is is free. Um, it stores those passwords in Active Directory, makes it super easy to change. I know that sounds weird that local passwords would be stored in Active Directory, but but trust me, it works. Um, they get synced uh, basically as the machine while the machine is on the domain and, and connected. Um, and, and so I, I like Laps uh, a lot, um, but uh, there are better features, uh, admittedly, with some commercial products. Um, just be aware that uh, you know I've run into folks who are like, yeah, we're budgeting uh, you know next year to employ uh, vendor you know vendor X, right? Uh, the reality is that don't wait, don't wait at all. Uh, deploy Laps, right? You may find that that's a good enough solution. Um, and also, a lot of the vendors come out and they're like, hey, look at this feature, right? Um, I, I bought a new car recently, or bought a new car this year. And some of the features that they had in these vehicles, I was like, neat. And then the sales people kept, kept coming back to them. But I was like, dude, that's neat, but it's not something I care about, right? Like, like for instance, there was one vehicle, he's like, oh yeah, the, the coolest thing about this is it's got two cigarette lighter jacks in the back seat. So your passengers that are rolling around, look, I'm done right there. You had me at back seat because I don't drive people around, right? And, and if you're in my vehicle, um, you can suck it up, Buttercup, as far as your phone goes. I don't need that stuff there, right? So, so while it's a neat feature, I shouldn't be paying more for it. I shouldn't be thinking about uh, that as as part of my. And look, they know this, and the vendors know this. There's a psychological trick here where you know they're providing you more features, and even though you don't need them, don't care about them, won't use them, um, it, it's still uh, they they know that it still appeals to you, it still speaks to you, right? Laps for the win. Um, other big one: have a plan for changing service account passwords in a domain. We've got a, a client who, for the last four years, we've gone back and pen tested, um, and uh, every year, uh, every year, same service account passwords, same service account passwords. They're like, how'd you get in? I'm like, we reuse the same password that we used, uh, we used before, right? Attackers know these account passwords aren't changed regularly. Um, I know it's a big religious event to go in and change something like HP OpenView or or whatever those accounts are that are used across. Uh, you've got probably an account uh, to get LDAP. Uh, services for your uh, uh, goodness for your printers and your multifunction devices, and I know this stuff's hard to change. Your attackers do too. Um, look, the reality is that uh, if you've got good inventory, uh, and and look, it's it's really painful the first time, and it's really easy the second time around, right? Uh, you know, painful the first time because we don't have a good map, a good inventory of what's actually on our network, and our admins aren't ready to do the actual work. I'm gonna close here and just say that, look, nothing I've said today is revolutionary. If, if you've been in InfoSec for any period of time, you've heard most of these recommendations before, and I could go on and on and on um, with, you know, with hardening. I will mention too, by the way, that, uh, you know, if, if we were talking about, you know, basically the, the 30 or so minutes I've been talking about device hardening, um, these are not necessarily the, the biggest priorities that I would talk about in device hardening. I, I wanna make sure that, that everybody's clear, you know, with the takeaways here, um, these are great device hardening and network hardening uh, you know, techniques, but, but really all of this is around forcing the attacker to make more noise because they're going to, right? Um, they're absolutely going to. Kind of thinking about the service accounts that we just talked about, changing the service account password. After you do that, um, there should be no noise around those service accounts. And if somebody fails, I, absolutely a failed login for a service account is a, is a pry one, uh, pry one event, right? Priority one event, because my, my problem there is that I know somebody is is trying to trying to log in is that um, I shouldn't be having failures there. Usually those service accounts are set once and forget it, right? Until we have to change the password again. Every time we change it, we're gonna get some noise. But but again, I'm looking for ways that I can find the attackers making noise. Um, I'll tell you that that's big for me because I wanna be able to detect the attackers, right? I wanna change the environment, model the environment. We talk a lot about active defense. Active defense is not hacking back. It's, it's using the attackers TTPs against them. It's modeling our environment so that the attacker makes noise for detection. I'm gonna tell you, you can't prevent 100% of attackers from getting in, that's just reality. Um, you should be ready to detect them when your defenses fail. And a lot of what we do, a lot of what we've done in the past, and, and a lot, what a lot of organizations continue to do is build a wall and hope that the attacker won't get over the wall. If they get over the wall, though, we're blind to it, right? We haven't really architected around that. 
And that's what most of these uh, recommendations are designed to do, is detect the attacker doing what they do. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Carol, who I suspect is going to hand it back to John, and, and we'll go from there. Okay, I'll take it directly. Great stuff. A uh, reminder to our audience, I've got a bunch of questions here. If you've got more questions, enter them into that question window on the right-hand toolbar side. Um, what I'm going to do, I'll start with a couple point questions to each of you based on the material presented, Then, uh, and each can field a way in after the first one answers. And then uh, we'll have some sort of bigger ticket, big concept uh, questions I'll throw out, toss out to both of you guys uh, after that. So let's see. I'll start with John Strand. Since you talked a lot about cloud, used a lot of uh, Azure and O3, Office 365 examples. What different in a uh, AWS environment, different with Google Cloud or essentially the same, uh, less security capability or logging information more? What's the difference for people using AWS or say Google Cloud stuff? A lot of the exact same types of vulnerabilities for two-factor authentication exist. And a lot of it boils down to a simple problem is authenticating and making sure if you're on the cloud side, making sure that the person that's actually authenticating to you is actually the person authenticating to you. Um, and this is an issue because you honestly don't know. I mean, people shift from computers to phones to new computers to different computers. So it's not something I don't see being fixed anytime real soon. And also with that question, and those other questions are like, well, is there any vendor that's doing it better than other vendors? And right now I would say Microsoft is ahead of the pack, probably by a wide margin because of the two products that I talked about for Office 365 and then um, also the Security Center for Azure. And that tells me at least, Mike, at least Microsoft's thinking about it. You know, they're trying to implement these types of protections to stop multiple concurrent logins or logins from strange IP addresses. They're at least thinking about these issues. And I think they're quite a bit further ahead than Google and Amazon. Okay, we just had a question come in, uh, I'll direct to you, and the point question is, how would CredSniper interact with DuoPush for two-factor authentication? So with DuoPush, what you do is you don't, with CredSniper, you wouldn't use that. You would actually use MailSniper. And the reason why is, look at where Duo is actually implemented. It's not a problem so much in Duo, because we get this all the time. People are like, well, we're using Duo. What are you going to do about that? I'm just going to find another door. And CredSniper articulates that very well. You'll use Duo on OA right? And it works great. That's fantastic. But then you have this Exchange Web Services backdoor that's wide open that doesn't really support Duo, or Duo is not enabled on to be more accurate. So whenever you're attacking these infrastructures, understand it's not an issue of trying to bypass that technology. And the core problem ultimately boils down to, I can still harvest user IDs. I can still harvest passwords. I may not be able to authenticate, but once I've harvested enough user IDs and passwords, I'm just going to go away from the door that has two-factor authentication, and I'm going to go find something else. You may have it enabled on OA. You may have it enabled on Office 365, but you may not have it enabled on this really janky um, you know, a SharePoint server that's sitting over here. So a lot of what we do is, of course, trying to bypass that whenever we're trying to do spear phishing, but a tremendous amount of what we do is harvesting those credentials and then using those credentials in other doors that don't have the level of security that you would expect to be there. Okay, before I go over to Jake with a question, you've been using the term, in your talk, you use the term password spraying, often see uh, other attacks called credential stuffing. Same thing, different? What, what do people need to know about those two? They're a little bit different. Whenever you're looking at password spraying, password spraying is where you use a specific password. Um, like uh, what's the big one that we're using now is uh, I think the big one that we're using now is um, I think we're now moving on to winter, uh, winter 2019. I think is what we're actually trying to do. And what we're doing is just using a single password against a whole bunch of uh, user IDs that we've enumerated. And we're trying to do that because we're, we're desperately trying to stay underneath the account lockout threshold where it, if we have failed or fail, five failed login attempts within a specific time period, it's going to lock the account out. We just don't want that to happen. Um, now, whenever you're talking about credential stuffing, that's where you're taking breached usernames and passwords and trying to gain access to accounts. So if you go to have I been pwned and you do just a search on your email address, there's probably a very good possibility that your account has been compromised someplace else, right? And the attackers are going to use those credentials that have been breached in third-party services like io9, Krakatoa, Fleshbot, 
um, any of the large breaches, rock you and so on. And you may have an account that has been breached out there and you can find those out on Pastebin. So it's a little bit different, right? With the password spraying, we're trying one password or you know, putting it over time, like waiting a day or so and trying another password of like company name one, two, three, the season in the year, uh, change me, change me one, two, three, four, and trying variations on that. Whereas credential uh, stuffing is we're taking existing compromised credentials from third party sites and then trying to reflect that against your organization. Either way, less or more likely to ring bells and, you know, standard alerting. You know, Jake, I'd love to get your take on this. There is no way that these shouldn't be lighting up like a Christmas tree. Um, whenever somebody's doing this type of password spraying attack, it bothers me that you've got to buy an expensive UBA product to actually start detecting password sprays. But, uh, but yeah, you should be able to detect that. If you have an IP address that's generated X number of uh, failed login attempts over a five minute period, like, you know, 100 failed login attempts in five minutes, you should be blocking that IP address or at least slowing the authentication messages down or trying to pair it up IP address, user agent strength, get a little bit more granular on who's authenticating. But it, it really bothers me that this still works. Yeah, you know, to, to that point, John, um, I, I'm with you. It bothers me. It still works as well. But, you know, um, a lot of people will step back and they say, well, I set an alert and, you know, uh, too many I, uh, too many user uh, accounts logging in from the same IP address and in a fixed period. Um, you know, th there are things that do that, uh, like SharePoint, for instance, that does that. Uh, your SharePoint server does. Outlook Web Access, uh, you know, will do that as well. And and so, you know, th there are some uh, there are some servers that are going to do that. But, but to your point, um, you know, again, uh, it is something that, that shouldn't work uh, in general, and it should be easy to alert on. Again, a lot of folks kind of take the, well, the heuristic has to work 100% of the time. I, I'm much more of, and I, I think you probably will agree here, is that, you know, the, the heuristic doesn't have to work 100% of the time. Um, you know, we, we can tune out our false pauses. We, we can set exceptions to, to any, given, uh, any given rule. Okay, Jake, you brought up the concept of a collection management framework. Probably 80% of the people out there have a SIM product running around doing something. Is a collection management framework sort of SIM plus processes and playbooks answering those questions? Or what, what do I need to actually say I have a collection management framework versus I'm just running a SIM product somewhere? Yeah, um, you know, the, the good news, uh, if you have Excel, uh, you can uh, you can use a collection management framework, right? Um, the uh, and if you can't afford Excel, uh, no, good, good news, LibreOffice uh, also has a spreadsheet looking thing that you can run there too. You don't need a lot of money here uh, tool-wise to do this. Um, your collection management framework really augments your SIM. Uh, you could think about this more as a, an inventory of what's actually in, uh, an inventory of what's actually in my SIM. Although, uh, you know, sometimes I have data, very often uh, in a well-architected SIM, um, I have data that, that's, that I care about that's in my collection management framework. Um, that's not in uh, not in my sim. R really, what we're talking about here is an inventory. And I want to I want to go go a little bit deeper on that too, because I I love that idea. Because a collection management framework, I would I would be a little bit more emphatic and say it's not your sim. Your sim can be part of that collection management framework, but the collection management framework is all the places that you can pull data from. Number one, what type of data you can get, and then what type of refinement procedures you have around it as well. Um, and, I, and I think it really feeds into, I think it was like three slides that Jake had where he didn't just talk about getting, um, getting access to logs, but can you actually scale your log fidelity up in the middle of an incident? I would say that that's part of your collection management framework as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah, the, it, you know, as a point of fact, um, your SIM in most cases won't answer the questions that your collection management framework is, is uh, that you need for that collection management framework. Um, you may go to the SIM to get some of that data. That may be where you access that data. But really, this is around what's getting what's getting logged into the SIM, right? Am I forwarding DNS logs there, for instance? Okay, if so, how long? What's our retention policy around that specific log type? What types of questions can I answer with my DNS logs, right? Uh, I know what domains we contacted uh, or attempted to contact. Um, depending on my DNS architecture, I may not actually be able to see the source that requests, depending where the log is at, right? If I've got uh, you know multi-tiered DNS architecture, I'm logging at the last server before it goes out to the net. Um, you know, I, I may not be able to see uh, then which client made that request. I go on and document that and say, okay, you know, here's the question I can answer. Did we try to visit a domain? Right? Here's a question I can't answer. Who tried to visit the domain? Right? And I'm going to have to pivot to NetFlow for that. Okay. Well, what's my retention? Do I have a retention disparity between my NetFlow uh, data as well as my uh, as well as my DNS, right? Uh, one retention for 30 days, one for 60. Uh, again, that's stuff that uh, when you start pulling that apart, 
you know, you get away from in the middle of an incident going, oh man, we should have matched the, the retention on these and, you know, get rid of the coulda, woulda, shouldas. And I, I, I think also, Jake, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a tremendous amount of that is actually a little bit of the refinement. Because right now, so many companies are like, well, I don't know what type of network traffic I should look at, so I'm going to do full packet capture. Unless you're like a DOD level organization, I don't see the need for many organizations to go to like full packet capture. Or if you look at a SIM, they're like, oh, we don't know what event logs we should have. Let's just log everything and let ArcSight sort it out for us. I think that that's, that's one of the prevalent problems in computer security is when we're confronted with not knowing what we should be capturing, we default to capturing everything. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good, uh, really good point there too. You know, and, and I, I kind of pivoted on this uh, without really uh, uh, elaborating on it before. But um, you know, I, I said there's stuff that you probably shouldn't have in your sim, data that you care about that you shouldn't have in your sim. Um, look, uh, you know, when, when we talk about logging and, and where do we log stuff, my, my sim is a correlation engine, right? Um, and if you've, you've probably heard the term uh, or heard me use the term in the past, the uh, log toilet. Um, you know, I, I like to dump logs that I just need for, uh, you know, for retention purposes and investigative purposes. If it doesn't serve a correlation purpose, that, that's going into syslog. Uh, I'll happily dump it into Elastic, uh, Elastic Search, maybe with a Kibana front end, uh, you know, when, when, when we're done. Um, but, but I want to, uh, you know, for analysis side, but, but I want to go ahead and, and get that out of my SEM so my SEM can do correlation better on, on smaller data sets. Um, there's no reason for me, if I'm not doing correlation, uh, you know, on uh, a particular logging source uh, or a particular event log type, um, then I may want to keep it. I just don't want it in my SEM, right? And I can expand my, my retention around the stuff that I really need. Like, for instance, process execution logs, uh, the 40, event ID 4688s, those are phenomenal, right? I want lots of those, right? Um, but uh, I'll tell you that there's some of them that uh, I care less about, some of them that I, even within that, that I care more about. Um, you know, maybe I have full retention on my event logs for 30 days, um, in a uh, basically using a syslog forwarder, and it's dumped into Elastic. And then for uh, you know 4688, it's my process creations. Maybe I've got 180 days of those specifically, right? So anyway, so we, we've tended to talk here about things largely running out in infrastructure as a service. You know where we have we can run we can run things at the uh, process level, but lots of companies out there have lots of sensitive stuff running. Software as a service, it's out there, Salesforce apps or travel voucher apps, other things that are software as a service. What, what are you guys seeing? What's the recommendations for how do I get the application level log information they might be able to get from those type of things into the, under the covers and into the framework here? Uh, the, that's really where the CASBs are coming in, right? You know, basically saying we're going to be able to collect that information to make sense of it. The problem that I have with it is a lot of the services that you're using, um, and many of the APIs that are out there. They just don't have that log fidelity to begin with. I remember we had a uh, we had an incident. It was a full blown incident that turned out to not be an incident. But we had a full blown incident that we started looking into where we thought we were compromised at BHIS, and somebody had actually hacked um, into our Google App domain and uh, was able to gain access to potentially sensitive data. And what it actually turned out to be was, um, <laughs> it actually turned out to be TripIt. Uh, there's a website, uh, tripit.com, where you can load an app on your phone, and then that app gets access to your email, it gets access to your, uh, it gets access to your email, it gets access to your, uh, your, your files, it gets access to your calendar, it gets access to absolutely everything. And one of our users had this, had this installed on their phone, and it has a randomly named application ID whenever you look at your Google account. And it looked just really suspicious. And the only way that we were able to figure out what was actually going on with it was basically tracing back the IP address to this randomly named app and was connecting back to one of TripIt's servers. Now, for me, we didn't have any logs as far as like, what did it access? What files did it access? What, uh, what, uh, what, what emails did it access? We just didn't have that level of fidelity because it just didn't exist. Uh, it came out uh, about six months afterwards that Google came out with additional logging fidelity that we could get additional data, but it still wasn't there. So right now there's absolutely no consistency when you're looking at cloud services as far as what they log, what they do not log, and whether or not it's going to be in compliant with your existing compliance standard framework that you're looking into. So this is a problem with security showing up at the end of the conversation about moving things to the cloud. They're like, yeah, well, we're all using Salesforce. We're going to use their API. And uh, Salesforce is going to be awesome. Now security, secure it. 
And at that point, it's really too late. I mean, in not even talking about securing it or testing it or finding vulnerabilities, but there should be some fundamental questions at the beginning of the conversation to say, does this particular service support the logging and fidelity that we need to meet our compliance standards? And most often the answer is not. Okay, got a question coming here on the cloud side. I think this is a great question. When it was a little context, when VMware first started penetrating and data centers started getting virtualized, we had all kind of proselytizing that all security problems were over and network security would all be solved within the virtualization framework, et cetera. Here's the question, um, and I'll toss it to John first. Have you seen micro segmentation working in cloud environments of large organizations? Can you comment Never. on that? Never once. Um, the whole concept of micro-segmentation and having the different cloud services, the different cloud APIs, and then establishing different uh, cloud-based API firewalls, not necessarily basically on uh, just the ports that are being used, but actually doing a deep inspection of what's going on. There's a lot of technologies that are out there that are coming up. And it's Enterprise Security Weekly. We talked about four or five of them. I can't even remember their names. It's like every week there's four or five new vendors in this space. Uh, great. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. I haven't seen it. And that happens a lot. Uh, in this industry where I see vendors that are bantered about and talked about, and I just don't see them. Now that may be that our customers don't have those products in place, but by and large, I'm not seeing that level of segmentation. I go back to one of the core comments that I said earlier, we can't even segment our internal networks properly. So how do we expect companies to actually jump to the point where they're doing micro segmentation uh, for the various services and the APIs that are being used? So if you can't do that basic level of segmentation just within your workstations, there's no way you're going to be able to handle that level of complexity without uh, doing a really, really hard in-depth look at how you're handling security now and how you're going to handle staffing and how you're going to handle uh, training for it. So yes, there are services out there. Yes, they have been enabled on some of our customers, but most of the time it's so wide open as far as permissions to just be rendered absolutely useless. Jake, any comments on that? Well, I mean, absolute heresy is what I heard. Um, I just heard John say that micro-segmentation was, was going to be difficult, and uh, every vendor that I've talked to tells me <laughs> that micro-segmentation is just is easy. I mean, look at all the success story. Oh, wait, Dude, sorry. You just, uh, drop some, story. you just drop some AI and some blockchain on that? <laughs> Boom. Right. You know what I always, you know what I point to when this started up was in Windows. I think it was Windows 2003. Microsoft came out with server and domain isolation, and also the Windows firewall built into every version of Windows. So the idea was then for every server you would have a security policy with firewall rules and server and domain isolation, and only talk to other ones that were in the Active Directory. Blah 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 blah. And the whole thing is, well, who defines those policies? Who tracks them? Where are the tools to set them and keep them going? And it's back to the infrastructure guys protecting the infrastructure. The server admins couldn't do it then. The virtualization guys uh, can't do it now. It's not, yeah, it's not as easy as they make out. it sound. Now we're pushing it down to DevOps, right? Right, right. Um, and I, I kind of agree with that, and I kind of disagree with it as well. I know that that's blasphemy, too. I should be all hailing and extolling the virtues of DevOps. But... Um, Honestly, the developers and the systems administrators and the operations team, their number one goal is keeping production alive. That's the way it's always been. And we somehow expect that now if we push security down to the DevOps where it's, you know, the developers are working with the operational people and the systems administrators and everybody's responsible at all stages, that somehow magically, because it's not their core job, to secure things, that their core job is keeping things up and running, that now magically they're going to be able to start securing those services at that low level. And I just don't, I just, I just don't buy it. I think some organizations, I think the tools are there. Um, just like you said, there's the Windows Firewall. It is out there, right? Go use it. No one does. I think the tools and the services are out there for the companies that want to do the right thing, but those companies are going to be in the minority. So Jake, well, you, you know, brought up an example where you felt you'd, you'd seen some security culture change. Can you bring up a counterpoint there? Oh yeah, no, hundred. Well, I, I have I seen it. Um, yeah, I have. It, it's few and far between, right? Um, you know, I, I love the example of the, the Sands Casino. Now, now, not Sands S A N S S A N D S Sands Casino. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, this is a great one to go Google. Um, there's a little bit of information out, you know, out there about it. Uh, there's some, you know, non-public information out there, but there, you know, that, that you may hear some rumint, I guess, might be another one there. Um, but the uh, Sands Casino, you know, basically uh, had a, a denial of service event um, after uh, the, the owner of the casino uh, said something nasty about uh, about Iran turning it into a glass parking lot or something. And Iranian hackers took, uh, you know, t took uh, offense to this and, 
and uh, you know knocked over the casino and and you know performed denial of service attacks internally bricked a bunch of machines and um, you know it was really interesting because uh, I've heard from some folks that used to work there that they knew uh, what was happening as it was happening and they knew they needed to segment the network they knew they needed to take drastic measures to do this nobody felt safe doing it because the number one number one was uh, don't ever make a change that hurts the gaming floor. And they knew to do this, they were going to have to take the gaming floor offline effectively, right? And, and nobody felt comfortable that their job was going to be secure, even though the worry was, uh, and, and I, it definitely came, came to be the case, came to pass, um, that, uh, you know, again, if you don't do this, if you don't take this action, we're, we're going to lose the gaming floor anyway. And they did. They were down for a couple of days. Uh, in, in Vegas, if you're not, uh, you know, gambling for, for a couple of days, that's a, that's a huge, huge loss. Um, so, so, you know, basically this is a spot where security culture wasn't baked in. You got security professionals that knew what to do, but they weren't comfortable doing it because they were worried about their jobs, right? Yeah. I contrast that to another organization, again, you know, one that we just worked with where, uh, again, from the top down, everybody knows, everybody from developer to uh, system admin uh, to obviously InfoSec to, to every user knows. A, security is their job. And this isn't something that they're briefing. It, it's, you know, like once a year in security awareness. They understand this that day in, day out. If they take a, a step that they believe, reasonably believe, is going to do, do right for their organization, then they're, they don't have to worry about their job at the end of the day. Even if it goes poorly, they don't have to worry about it. And I think yeah. that that's critical. And also kind of, you, John, you went looking for a counterpoint on security culture. Um, I honestly believe that uh, Jake's company rendition and BHIS, I think that we're on the pointy end of the spear. A lot of the customers that we see are the customers that are striving to do it right, that are trying their best to do it right. And to be honest, a lot of them are really good. I'm not going to be a pen that says, oh, we can break into any organization at any time. Look, I've had some customers over the past 15 years that absolutely have kicked my teeth in. But they are the exception. Uh, I do believe over the past, uh, Jake will come into, I would say with the, the past 18 to 24 months, we saw this explosion in security, uh, especially with a lot of the products that came online. And we saw organizations striving really hard to get into a truly secure position. And I think a lot of that was driven by ransomware. Um, I think a tremendous amount of that was driven by ransomware. But now you're kind of seeing ransomware kind of slow down. Not, it's not nearly as prevalent as it was. And I'm starting to see organizations start to be complacent, lackadaisical again. So I had a lot of hope for a while that we were seeing an, an improvement in the overall industry. But I've seen it slow down quite a bit. So, Jake, I'd like your take on that as well. Yeah, I think 18 to 24 months is, is pretty accurate. And I do think that ransomware is, is, is driving a lot of that. Um, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, we, we work a lot of the, uh, the Sam Sam and BitPamer uh, cases, BitPamer, by the way, far worse than Sam Sam. Um, but uh, you know, th these cases are, are not the isolated ransomware. You know, like I, I got it on one computer. This is the, you know, you've had a team in your network for weeks. Um, you know, doing pre-staging of, of ransomware, and, and and now they're turning it on all at once, right? Um, and, and so when that organization goes offline, um, there's a big, big push from the board to at least identify because it's not the ransomware that was the problem, right? And, and people talk about that ransomware was the end of the attack. The attack started weeks earlier um, and you know the attackers have been in the network for weeks and now they're looking for ways to detect that and and so we are seeing that big push and that big uplift after the fact and, and of course if your competitors got hit like that there's a big push to make sure you don't and yeah so I, I, I concur there 100%. Yep. There's also that consistency of the narrative right like when we had ransomware hitting and it was widespread and it was on the front page of the USA Today uh, that was that was kind of a collective experience but uh, some of the ransomware that I've seen, I think I've only seen like two or three, that scare me are where the attackers gained access and it wasn't automated. It was they got access and then they launched uh, the equivalent of the denial of service attack against the organization or locking systems out or locking files out. And that scares me a lot more because that's where an attacker is basically targeting an organization and they're basically setting the price after the fact based on what they have seen in that organization. And that's pretty horrific. Oh yeah, John. To that point, man, uh, we we did a great one uh, a while back uh, with with a customer. Where I say a great one, I mean it was a it was a really interesting case. Obviously, well, we get it's excited. Never it's for, bad. <laughs> yeah, it's never, it's never, it's never great for them, right? Uh, but but I mean, it was a really interesting case where um, you know, in a lot of these uh, vast majority of these cases, if you decide to pay, uh, you're not paying face value. You're not paying asking price. It's a uh, you know, it, it's 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 a negotiated price. They went back to negotiate, and they're like, hey, we can't we can't pay, and it was a multiple to six figure sum. 
They're like, we can't pay this sum. And uh, the attackers had taken a lot offline. In fact, they'd surgically hunted down their online backups and nuked them. Um, and, and so for weeks, the, the backups hadn't been working correctly, and they didn't know this until they tried to restore. Big, big, big emotional event there. They timed the encryption uh, around their business processes uh, to, to, you know, for maximum impact. Uh, you know, it basically right at the end of the month as they're doing processing, and it, it was just nasty. Anyway, um, when they came back and they said, hey, we need to, uh, we need to negotiate, uh, the attackers you know, said, we, we don't have this kind of cash on hand. The attackers sent them their P&L their profit and loss statement. They sent them their bank account statements. They said, BS, you have the cash. Here's proof you have the cash. Cut us a check, right? And, and it was relative no negotiation from there on out, right? Um, it was, you know, and that's that's a sinking feeling right there where you're like, okay, well, they'd set the price directly around what they knew they could pay. Yeah, we had we had one that was kind of similar to that where um, what they actually gained access to that caused the customer to freak out was their invoices. Um, so this is a large internet service provider and they could show that with their customers they were charging wildly different rates for the exact same service and they're like well we can send this to all your customers and that would have just sunk that company and i think that ties back into pen testing whenever you're pen testing you should be looking for those types of things what are the pain points and then basically identifying those pain points and the paths to get to them so let me pivot to uh, one more point question, then we'll do one big ticket question, and then it'll be about time to close out. Since you mentioned different prices for the same services, uh, both you guys do pen testing. A lot of people out there are taking courses from you on pen testing, but a lot of companies are still going to have to go outside to get pen testing services. How There's a million companies out there offering pen test services. How do people judge? What should they look for to be getting good pen test services? I got asked this question. I'll, numerous times at Gardner. I'll, I'll start. This is easy. Um, honestly, what what is the pen test firm giving back to the community? Um, Jake, I don't know where you just flew in. Are you even home right now? Yeah, I am. I, I flew okay. in from uh, uh, well, the, flew in from the Northeast last night. Uh, we, okay. we were taking down a bank. So. You know, if you look at Jake, if you look at uh, Dave Kennedy, if you look at In Guardians, if you look at uh, uh, Core with. Uh, uh, with Deviant, if you look at uh, tons of these companies, and I'm sorry if I didn't mention your company, all the people will be like, how come you didn't mention me? I'm like, oh, there's like seven or eight, and I can't remember them. I should have them printed out on my wall. I, I always call them our sister competitors. Uh, we, we, we compete with each other, but they're our sister organizations. And the one key theme that I see in every single one of these firms is their willingness to give back to the community. Uh, SpectraOps is fantastic. The, their blog on Medium has been just crushing it. Um, amazing webcasts, amazing tools to giving back to the company, uh, to the community as a whole. That's that's your canary in a coal mine. Is that company actively giving back to the community in in a way that's substantial? And if you look at Jake and the travel and everything that he's do he does, it's more than substantial. Um, it, it, it's foundational to the entire industry, and it bothers me whenever I look out in the industry. There's about 10, 15 people that are constantly giving back to the community with very foundational advice, very foundational moving the ball forward type advice to organizations, how to secure their organizations, different techniques that will be used. And all of us are almost like a panic trying to get this information out. And we really wish that just more people would see it. So yeah, if you have a company that's doing a lot in the community, giving a tremendous amount back, odds are you're not going to go wrong. Yeah, I, I think, you know, John, that, that, that's a great point. And, you know, we've talked a lot about that in the past. I, I think that's, that's a good measure of measure of an organization. And by the way, too, if, if you work for like a big four or whatever, we, we understand that, you know, there, there are folks there that are great, um, you know, and that, you know, your policies may not allow you to, to, to blog or publicly speak or, or you name it, whatever, whatever the case is there, right? I'm not, we're, we're not saying, or I'm certainly not saying that, that everybody at those, uh, some of the larger firms and, and uh, you know, or, or are the more uh, cookie cutter, uh, type stuff uh, is 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 bad. Um, just that I, I concur with John. I think you know a lot of it is is giving back to the community. You know, one of the ways that I, I always tell folks to uh, to evaluate, right, when they're like, hey, you know, why should we go with you and not your competitor? Um, is I just go pull up the web page, right? It's literally I go pull up my home page and you know I ask them, you know, who's your competitor? Who, who else are you considering, right? And we'll happily go pull them up too. Um, you know, if you go there, uh, you know, it, it's it's the it's the conference talks, and, and and ideally, it's not one person you know leading the way, right? I mean, my, you know, obviously, I'm the face of my organization. John's the face of his. Um, but you know, to your point about Spectre Ops, right? They've got they've got folks speaking all over the place, right? Um, I saw I, I constantly see people from Black Hills out speaking, right? Um, I've got other folks, uh, you know, same thing from Rendition, and we're moving more of them into those into those public speaking roles. And it, and it's not because 
scoop, you know, oh, awesome, I want you to go give a conference talk. Um, it, it really is the, I want you to go get back to the community. Um, same thing with blog posts, same thing with webcasts. Um, you know, and, and then also, if you take a look at, uh, just doing a quick Google search, um, find out who the media calls, right? Uh, you know, when, when they need, and, and I'm not talking about the talking heads on CNN, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about when they need actual actual tech reporters, right? You know, not like a ABC, CBS, whatever, but you, know, you look at your TechCrunch and your ZDNet and CyberScoop and whatnot. Again, you know, look at who they're calling to to get uh, to get you know uh, quotes from. Um, you know, they're not doing that because those people are necessarily available. It's because th th they're trusted, and you know, you you can look at some social proof from that as well. Um, I, I think all the way around. I think those are those are big things that you know that you can look for. And, and John kind of mentions right, Canary in the coal mine. Um, if you've got somebody who's brand new and just, you know, uh, brand new is starting out or, or doesn't focus on that kind of stuff, um, you know, they or, or are absolutely drowning trying, you know, do marketing and whatnot. Um, they're not, uh, you know, th they don't have the time to do all that stuff. They don't have the resources to do all that stuff because to a certain extent, I mean, you know, get, giving back uh, and, and pushing back into the community is I don't want to call it virtue signaling necessarily. But but if I have the choice between giving back to the community or, you know, cutting cutting payroll, Obviously, I'm going to cut payroll first, right? And I guess that kind of, uh, I guess I'll close out there. John, any other counterpoints there? Nope, I think that's very solid. Yeah, the two pieces, uh, the information sharing it was definitely uh, on my list. The other is, you know, ask, phone a friend at the InfraGuard meeting, at the ISAC meetings, or there's people in your industry, find out who they're using. And this, and then the final thing was always ask for sanitized copies of reports from a, that, of at least two they've done before and make sure the percent of boilerplate is relatively low um, and that you could see they're doing unique stuff against you versus sort of pushing the button on a boilerplate engagement. That was the parts I added. Now, let's close with uh, recommendations from both you guys. A lot of what you both talked about uh, as things to do, we kn we've known these for years, uh, but they don't get done. 90% of them tend to be things IT operations has to do or network operations has, has to do, uh, and security people have to do something to get things to change. So I'm going to toss out to both of you. We'll start with John. What are some of the successful success factors you've seen security programs overcome the obstacles of doing these things you've recommended? Wait, is there some common characteristics where you said, whoa, that those guys were hard to get into because they were doing these things? And what are some of the key ways they did it you can pass on to the audience? I think that, 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 that that's almost cheating. Um, and the reason why is our best customers are the people that have been through uh, classes with Jake or I. Um, our best customers are the people that go to the webcasts like this one. Our best customers, the ones that are part of IONS and uh, part of the IONS forums. Like we see these people again and again and again. And I think a lot of that has to do with the best customers that we have that are implementing things correct are the people that are hungry for the information. They're hungry for the training. They're hungry to try to do more than just what the absolute minimum is. And they just don't go, give up. And to be honest, that's the characteristic of a good hacker. And I mean the hacker in the best possible way. Um, if a hacker just wants to truly understand, wants to understand an application, wants to understand a network, and our best customers are the ones that seek to understand and they keep coming back again and again and asking questions and ask other people questions. So that would be my, my key characteristic that I see again and again. You know, I'm actually going to echo John here a little bit, although I want to take it an, another step further and almost make it a little more meta, right? You know, John talked about IANs, right? Uh, you know, that, that's that's a it's a subscription, uh, you know, for accessing experts, right? I um, mean, talked about uh, SANS, right? Uh, you know, let's let's not uh, let's not mince words here. SANS is expensive, right? It's quality. It's it's the highest quality in the industry, or, or I wouldn't be there. But but it's it's expensive. Um, and uh, you know, we we talk about the folks that are attending the webcasts, right? Your, your time has value. You, you, there's an opportunity cost here. You could actually be doing security now instead of listening to me and John, right? But let, let's step back for a second. What do all those things have in common, right? And, and a lot of other stuff that we we just didn't mention, and and that that's commitment, right? It, it's commitment to security. You you have a organizational, uh, really an organizational commitment to that security. Um, you know, John mentioned that the you know our best customers are the ones that we keep seeing out here. I, I echo that a hundred percent. Um, in fact, you know, when we have folks that, that come to us and say, hey, um, I want to get a pen test because I've been watching your webcasts. I, you know, read, uh, you know, for instance, your, you know, your, your checklist for the uh, for the meltdown inspector kind of remediation side. And and, and now we want to get this as a, uh, you know, get this done as a service. I, I already say, like, look, man, you, you probably are already ahead of our average customer, ahead of the industry and security, because I know because that's the way you came to us. 
um, you know, I already know that you have some commitment to security there. And, and I think that's really it. It's really a cultural change uh, that we have to drive from, from the top down. It's, it doesn't work from the bottom up, right? You have passionate people to come in. Um, again, if the, if the organization is not committing to security culturally, get out and go somewhere else, right? Okay, good stuff to end on. I'll uh, I'll sort of add, don't be afraid to break some things. Nothing changes without some breakage. And none of these things get better unless we're out there trying to convince people why we need to break some of the old ways of doing things. So with that, we're just about at the end of our time frame. Wanted to leave you guys with some resources to get additional information. I do a program called What Works, where the vendors give me users to interview of people who actually were able to implement privilege management or encryption or uh, outbound egress filtering and many of the things you heard about. The next major SANS event where you can uh, take classes or meet with people like Jake and John is SECI. Well, actually, the next one's in Washington, D.C. in a week. But as far as the one you could plan to go to, SEC East in New Orleans early next year. There's the URLs for the three sponsors of this. And once again, thanks to them for uh, helping uh, get this content out to you, the audience. If you are watching a recorded version or you just didn't get a question in time, you can send it at q at sans.org and we'll get you an answer from the right person. So with that, let me turn it over to Carol for any final words. All right, well, thank you so much, John, Jake, and John for your great presentation. And to Infoblox, Carbon Black, Bible Angel, and Cisco for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.